Hello, good evening, and welcome to Fiddler's Green podcast number 45, The Things We Carry. So this podcast is going to be a lot more laid back. I don't really have a presentation. I even started on the right slide. (laughs) So it's off to a great start. But this is going to be a much more laid back live stream. I didn't really have a monologue prepared, so to speak. Well, I guess I had a few things that I wanted to talk about, a few things I wanted to ruminate on about the last few weeks and the things we've been saying and, and the year that we have ahead of us. But I kind of wanted this to be a, a more, I don't know, a more reflective stream, a more reflective podcast where I just try to take stock of things as they are, things as they, as I see them. I was, I don't know, it feels it's already sort of the end of the year, or the end of the season, so to speak. There, We've, we've, we've come through the year 2000 and, 2023. I, I always feel like the year begins with Christmas and then it ends with Thanksgiving. That's more or less how it always feels to me, emotionally speaking. I mean, obviously, there's, there's the actual bringing in of the new year, right? But that's more or less attached with Christmas. That's more or less a perfunctory... Uh, extension of the Christmas season and and no no work is real I mean work is done you're finishing things up in the last part of the quarter at work but really the planning is going to be for next quarter it's going to be for the next year and I remember looking back in my notes uh, this is something that I I think I did this around November we were doing this is when I started doing these semi-weekly or bi-weekly or, you know, two or three times a month podcasts uh, sometime in 2022. And we've kept up, the tra- kept up the tradition, I should say. But one of the things I remember saying last year was that 2023 would answer a number of questions. There's a su- Going into the winter, there were a few open questions that, that were open. And the first one was, you know... What's going to happen with, well, there were, this was obviously, in, I think it was a little bit before November, I'm now realizing, because the first question I had in the fall of 2022 was whether Republicans were, would be able to mount an electoral pushback against the Democrats, considering how unpopular Joe Biden was. That obviously turned out to be false. That turned out to be you know, something that was not possible. I guess a sub-question to that would be whether the, the establishment could put the woke away, and we might get into that a little bit later. It, it seems like the answer to that in 2022, 2023, I should say, was mostly no, although there are certainly a lot of people in the establishment that are trying to do that. There's a lot of people in the establishment progressive order that realize how much this is hurting them, especially in the last month since the Israel-Gaza war started. Next questions I had were, I mean, they're really two of the same part. The The first one was, what happens when the State Department and by extension, the Pentagon, really the global American empire, what happens when they try to bring the war in Ukraine to a conclusion? Are, are they going to be able to, I mean, back then, there seemed like there was a possibility that the State Department might actually be able to talk or walk the walk or actually cash the checks that its mouth wrote and 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 overturn not only the offensive that putin had pushing into ukraine but also potentially to get a color revolution in russia Uh, none of that is happening moreover what we're looking at right now is the state department losing uh or potentially losing a war just as the media eye turns away from the situation ukraine appears to be on its last legs. There's no, I mean, even if it's not on its last leg, so to speak, even if they can maintain a perimeter around the Russian expansion, what's very, very obvious is that they're not retaking any of the territory that they've lost. And they're not going back to the 1993 borders of that country. And all of these illusions that, that they could accomplish that were more or less just propaganda pieces by the mainstream, which leaves Ukraine and the State Department in the humiliating position where they're going to have to accept a ceasefire on the grounds that were less good for Ukraine than the terms of peace Russia or Putin was offering at the beginning of this war. So subsequently, all future developments are going to necessarily be in the light of having um, of having uh, the uh, having essentially sacrificed an enormous number of Ukrainian lives 
for essentially nothing. Essentially nothing in terms of... Um, like I, we gave Russia a bloody nose. We stopped them from invading Ukraine, but that was never part of the larger Russian objectives in, in any kind of realistic scenario. And it certainly wasn't part of their Russian peace deal. The last question I asked in 2022 was what would be the ultimate fate of the American empire as the economy started flagging? Now, this is the one where I think it's a little bit more ambiguous, although not that much. What's really been apparent here is that things just get gradually worse and worse and worse. There's not any kind of big explosion. I mean, I, I, there still could be a housing crisis that occurs. Uh, obviously, I think there is going to be a housing collapse, a collapse in the housing market that will occur with these interest rates and with the fact that there is essentially no way that this market can sustain itself. And that's not financial advice. It seems to me that that's just what's what's going to happen. But but no large hiccup actually occurred. What happened is just the standard of living continued to decrease in the West, but very, 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 very gradually. And the political establishments in most Western countries were more or less completely unperturbed. The elections of people like Maloney in Italy did absolutely nothing to stem the tide of the migrant crisis. There's no political will in Europe to stem the tide of migrants that are coming into their countries, it appears. Uh, Right-wing parties continue to increase their share but of, of, of votes, but there's no ability for the establishment, the, the people, the deep state, the people who actually rule and govern the countries to execute on any of the populist desires. And so the entire Western world is in sort of this weird limbo, as it would seem. It's in this weird, uh, I don't know any other word for it other than limbo. It's in this weird holding pattern above any kind of development that could resolve the situation. Everything's getting worse. No one trusts the governments that are involved. They're ostensibly a right wing, but they don't do anything. In 2024, and I should kind of switch my slides over here, uh, we're going to essentially have to answer a, a new set of questions. So the, the big the big question in 2024 is really an American question, and that is exactly what is the 2024 election going to look like? Is it, it, is it going to look like something even remotely like what 2016 looked like? Is it going to look like what 2020 looked like? I mean, what did 2020 even look like? 2020 looked like an extended crisis situation with riots going on everywhere, and then a bunch of incredibly questionable shenanigans going off on the side, trying and then eventually resulting in a political victory that made absolutely no sense, that resolved absolutely no questions, and that saw the emergence of a coalition that almost nobody really believed in. The Democrats who voted for Joe Biden didn't really. I mean, a few aging baby boomers believe in Joe Biden's message. But Joe Biden's message is, Joe Biden's message is essentially that we're going to go back to 1994. It's the same back to the Fresh Prince idea. It's back to Bill Clinton. It's back to Jimmy Carter. It's back to the 20th century. That's the illusion of the 20th century is Joe Biden. Joe Biden gets up on stage and talks about how America is so powerful it, it can finance Ukraine, it can finance Israel, it can it can chew, it can walk and chew bubble gum. We're the greatest country in the world, guys. No one believes it anymore. No one believes in America's moral right to project power in the international stage. No one believes in America's vision for the future in terms of actually creating a society that people want to emulate in other countries. Every everyone knows that this is a declining state, but no one can do anything about it because the deep states of most countries have such a lock on power that no one can actually move towards anything that's remotely useful or remotely even interesting. This creates a problem for a political YouTube uh, because, I mean, there's something really to, there was lots of talk about. I mean, I could talk about any number of things. We'll talk about some fights I had on Twitter and people have been really eager for me to talk about these fights I've had on Twitter. And some of them are a little bit juicier than others. And I'm sure I, I, I'm really tired, as you can tell, but I'll try to get as angry as possible. People like it when I get angry, so I'll try some of that stuff. But I mean, this is, I always talk about this stuff, and this is sort of the most notable thing, the most notable difference about what it feels like to be a streamer in 2023 relative to what it felt like to be on YouTube in 2016, is that nobody is really listening to anything. I, I, obviously, we have a number of successes that we'll talk about. 
I think Bask leaving this year, 2023 for me at least, was just the gangbuster year for Basket leaving as far as this, I'm concerned. This, this is where we really put down a flag and got, I mean, not every chapter is very strong. You know, uh, the New Jersey chapter, we're, we're trying, we're, we're, we're bringing things up. Uh, but but some chapters are very strong, and, and it's very true to the form. You, you always need to understand that no organization is ever stronger than the core group of its founding members. So this is just going to have to be a process. But at least Basque weaving was a proof of concept. So there's a lot of things that are going on in this sphere. And I, now, I'll also say this. This was also the year of, of an explosion in right-wing publications, of substacks, of fiction, of music, of all these sorts of things that are just amazing. I don't even have time to consume all of it. I mean, I don't really have very much time to begin with. <laughs> and you're probably going to ask me why I spend so much time on Twitter, given that fact. But I mean, there's so much stuff that's going on in the distant sphere in terms of art creation and essays and, and analysis that, that I can't consume at all. I can't keep up with it all. It's an entire separate ecosystem emerging of, of of cultural perspectives and cultural creation that we haven't seen in a very long time. And I, I think that this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning because the mainstream is completely collapsing around us. And as we see more degradation of these things, uh, the opportunities for creating alternatives are only going to flower forward. And, and we'll talk about this stuff a little bit more. One thing that definitely has not flowered forward in any meaningful way is discourse. Uh, discourse has completely died, and I, I, I miss it in, in a lot of ways. And, and it just, you know, I was saying this whole thing about the, the four horsemen of, of, disc, dis, of, of discourse, like retarded, gay, fake, and cringe, or cringe, gay, fake, and retarded. Uh, ev every conversation you have falls into one of these categories where you, you just kind of look at this person this person's put in front of you and this person is this person must be high iq this person must be high iq you're looking at them and saying okay there's a thought process that's going on in your head and i'm going to try to interact with it but but i know that there, there's not actually any kind of dialectic like there's you're not going to make concessions to me like you're there's not an attempt on your end to come to an understanding of what i believe and I mean, I'm trying to understand what you believe. I'm trying to develop a psychological profile for you, but, but there's no effort to reciprocally trying to come together as a people. And this is something that I think 2023 is going to decide. Uh, I, I'm actually, the, the, well, if I were to re-ask the question, if I were to, you know, I had three questions this year, or, or three questions this year, but for 2023 in, in October of 2022, I had three questions for 2022. Uh, the obvious question for 2024 is, will there be a real election? Meaning, is this election going to be something that's up in the air or that feels up in the air? And you always can tell that elections feel up in the air because when elections feel up in the air, people really have honest-to-God discourse. They try to reform coalitions. They try to get you on side. In 2016, everyone was constantly willing to just jump on live streams, jump on live streams, jump on live streams. People couldn't stop talking to each other because there are so many new ideas going around, buzzing around in the air. People were changing their minds back and forth, or questioning their presuppositions, trying to come, to come up with the, what their real values were, and, and trying to develop coalitions that held the line politically against their opponents or against things that they really didn't want to happen. Anything could happen in 2016, and that's the mark of when real power is up for grabs. This is something that you, you, you understand a lot. You know, who is, who is in power? Who is in power? Is it, I mean, there's obviously, it is the center left that's in power. And it's been the center left that's been in power since the end of World War II. <laughs> Not the communists, although the communists are their little pets, but the center left democratic coalition of intellectuals and media, media guys and, and, and savvy industrialists who also tend to vote Democrat, and, and the sort of progressive, worldly, liberal progressive idea of the global village. This has been the vision of the world since 1946 and actually going back further probably till the 1920s when these ideas came up after World War One. This has been the vision for the world. These people are in power. This is the reigning religion of our society. So it's not surprising who's in power, but you can always tell in a conversation who's who's dialectically in charge because you're having a conversation 
and then one person, you know, feels threatened and the response is, I'm going to slam the door in your face. Like, boom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excommunicate you. I'm going to get you out of this dialectic space. Uh, that's a symbol that they have power. If you if your response to a threat is to punish or slam the door in someone's face or to end the dialectic, that's obviously a symbol that you are not in power. Because if you thought that I had more power, then this dialectic could only, you know, by exchanging our ideas and by getting me to be more sympathetic with your worldview, this dialectic could only increase your ability to project power into this world, to have your concerns actually listened to. You know that power is up for grabs when the dialectic flows, so to speak. And, and the dialectic was flowing in 2016. So the obvious question, the obvious question for 2024 that I could ask, or that seems like it would be implicit, that, that it would be sort of natural for me to ask, is will we have an actual election that that's sort of dialectically open, where, where power seems to be at stake, and you get the feeling in the summer of 2024 that anything could happen? Um, I would ask that question, but I'm not going to ask that question because I already know the answer to that question. And the answer to that question is absolutely no. <laughs> In 2015, on the build up to 2016, people, everyone could feel something changing in the air. The spirit of the entire Western world was going through a transformation in 2015 and everyone could feel it. Just buzzing in the background. It was undeniable. Uh, there is no such sense of dialectic freedom in the air today. No one's going to be opening up the debate stages for debate. No one's going to be opening the airwaves for communication. No one's trying to find new friends. They should be trying to find new friends, and we'll talk about that again. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the dreaded question that, that everyone that everyone hates, but we can't uh, get away from in uh, in in this, these eras of, of time when where there's a war in Israel. We can, can't get away from this stuff. Uh, people should be looking for friends. People should be looking to rebuild their coalitions and to be open for a dialectic. And, and I want to, but but they're not because the majority of people are too invested in the power structure and are too afraid of what could lie outside of that power structure to actually engage it, engage with something new. Because dialectic opens up for the possibility of a genuine power change. It creates a situation where new ideas could radically enter into the fray. And if you don't have any answers or any way to kind of portray yourself as an honest individual who's dealing with those questions and who's honestly trying to grasp, grapple with their implications, then you stand to lose power and security very, very quickly. And it, it really is the, the, the purpose to, to kind of change this dynamic. But this is all my material. I, I know that there's not going to be an open dialectic in the year 2024. It's going to be even more closed than it was in 2020 when we're all literally locked in our houses. There's no way there's, I would, I was, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to do for debates because I don't think that Biden wants to debate. And I don't think that the mainstream media wants to air it. I don't think they want to let Trump on the ballot because we're all really, really far away from the Roe v. Wade decision, which was the one albatross around the neck of the Republicans. Nobody likes Biden. No, absolutely nobody likes Biden. And actually, very, very few people are afraid of Trump because he was president for four years. Uh, the, the idea that the deep state and the media do not want to put Trump on the ballot in any fair way. No one wants to host debates. No one wants to host dialectics because they're too risky. The question is not whether there's going to be an election in 2024. There's not going to be an election in 2024. The question is whether, how much can whatever we call that's going on in 2024 be made to look like a real election where there's actually a real conversation. I mean, the whole point of an election is that we have a national conversation. So it at least feels like we've come to some conclusions about the political directions people have gone in. That's the only way this works. I mean, obviously one side wins and the other side loses, but the idea of an election is that this is a process we're going through. And at the end of the process, people feel like that this has been talked over and, and there's some kind of established separate peace or reconciliation or moderation or understanding that goes forward about who has power, who's the overdog and who's the underdog. 
there cannot be any kind of conciliance in this regard anymore because the narratives won't sustain it. The Democrats obviously can't portray themselves as the underdogs and they can't take responsibility for what's actually going on in this country. None of their rhetoric actually matches up with reality, either on the radical side or on the moderate boomer side. And so the only way they have of managing this is to shut dialectic down completely. But how, how far does this go? How far does it go to make sure that there is absolutely no political decision that gets made in 2024? Uh, is, it, is it Trump being in jail at Election Day? Is it Trump being not listed on the ballots? Is it just not having a debate? Is it not having any televised coverage? Is it having Trump be, I mean, Trump can't get defenestrated from Twitter, obviously, because of Elon Musk. But but a total media blackout on the Trump campaign, I mean, what, what does that accomplish? I mean, that, that all that means is that social media essentially becomes a facilitation of a debate going forward. I mean, how can they go into 2024 and not pretend like there is not... I mean, the message for the last four years is that every single contestation of the mainstream Joe Biden narrative is not a legitimate argument. Should we encourage further escalation of the war in Ukraine. That is not a legitimate conversation. That is that is Putin apologia. How much, you know, how much should we lock down? Should we force people to take vaccines? That was not those were not legitimate debates. That was vaccine denialism. That was COVID denialism. That was uh, science denialism. The same thing for global warming, the same thing for border control, the same thing for inflation. Inflation was not a, was not a discussion. It, it's, and, and if you listen to Paul Krugman, it's still not happening. There's still been absolutely no inflation. It's totally fixed. The prices that you see at the grocery store are just an illusion of your own peasant mind not being able to perceive the sublime reality uh, of, of the Neo-Keynesian Krugman model, which says that inflation is entirely taken care of. Uh, there, there's, and there's no, there's no debate over, there's no debate over George Floyd. There's no de debate over the innocence of, of the one police officer who, who killed him, but probably is not guilty of murder if the coroner's reports are supposed to be, <laughs> if we believe the science of the coroner's reports, it, it, it does not look like he is guilty of murder. Just definitionally, it couldn't be because it doesn't appear that George Floyd was actually killed in the way that was described by the media. But there's no debate over that. There is no debate over transgenderism. There is no debate over and, and yeah, there's no debate over Israel, Palestine. Even both sides like this is a this is a, a conflict that I have absolutely no dog in the fight. I have no dog in the fight of Israel, Palestine. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Arab. I, I have no kinsmen from from the Levant or Palestine or or even Mesopotamia in any kind of fashion I'd care about. This is not something I... But, but it's not a conversation between Team Palestine and Team Israel. It's two sides shouting at each other that they don't have the right, they don't have standing to actually have a debate in the first place. And this is always funny to me, like Ben Shapiro. Otherwise, to his credit, Ben Shapiro actually has been having debates against the Palestinian side. You know, I, I always thought this was kind of cute that, uh, you know, our, our two favorite uh, pseudo academics, Ben Burgess and Matt, Mc, uh, Matt McManus, were, were on Twitter going, oh, man, look at Ben Shapiro debating the only people he's comfortable actually debating college undergrads. Isn't that kind of skeezy? Oh, man, I guess it takes a big man to make college undergrads feel stupid. And you're just thinking to yourself, dude, you run philosophy seminars for undergraduates. That's your job is to essentially debate against undergrads. I, is this all of a sudden kind of a skeezy activity? But, but that's regardless, regardless of whether Ben Shapiro has these little show debates, there's no national conversation going on over the legitimacy of of Israel or how to properly govern the Arab states. Or, or any, any of the kind of classical ideas that actually govern the parameters of this conversation. Because, because there's too many, I mean, there's just too many implicit questions that, from both sides, right? There's too many implicit questions from both sides that immediately come into play once this doesn't become a question over who has the legitimacy. And once this becomes a question over what, what we actually do policy-wise. I mean, the question, the, the left, obviously, on the, on the Israeli side, 
And the, the question immediately is like, well, I'm only ahead of myself, but the, the question is what constitutes a legitimate state and, and, and what, and, and what, uh, and what constitutes ethnic cleansing and how, how, how responsible is it to then export the problem that's just so horrible. It can't exist in the Middle East to a random European country or Canada. These Questions make no sense. Uh, on the left, I guess the left is sort of marginally, marginally more, um, you know, it's marginally more sane in the sense that at least this latest iteration of anti-Israel, anti-Jewish stuff, at least that's sort of in keeping with their previous ideas of anti-colonial struggle and land backism. Although even then, it's just, it's kind of cuckoo, right? <laughs> it's just like... I mean, it's it's oh, it's land back in Israel, and that means land back in North America too. I mean, land back in what the fuck are you going to do with land back in North America, dude? Land back in North America, you can land back my house. I mean, okay, so I'm sitting here. I said this before. Land back. Anti-colonialism is necessarily an imperialist project at this stage. It, it can't even be phrased. I mean. It, we're we're going we're we're right out of things that could conceivably be done in the name of communism or even race communism. Land back is genuinely what the third world portion of the left wing coalition wants, and I've I said this before. The the left wing coalition, the most coherent side of the left, are the third worldists, the third worldists, because they they know who they are. <laughs> They're, they are the Palestinians, they are the Arabs, they are the Africans, they are the Bantu, they are, they are, the, they are the Maghreb, they are the, the, the Libyans, uh, they are the Turks, they are the Russians, if you want to scoop them into the whole umbrella, although I guess this doesn't count because they're not third worldists, right? They know who they are and they know what they want. They want, I mean, they want two things. One's more reasonable than the other. The one is they want certain territorial concessions that they believe were taken away from them at previous iterations of the imperial project, which makes them very similar to the grievances that people like Putin have with Ukraine. And the second one that no one wants to admit, but is obviously the motivating Quality. For, and you see someone like uh, Syra Rao, who does the whole race to dinner thing. This is an incredibly bitter, you know, this is an incredibly bitter woman. And, and she she hates, hates, hates white people. And every now and again, you see a few people like this, uh, Indians and, and Chinese people. And obviously, when, when it comes to sort of the typical anti-white hatred you get coming out of communities like, uh, you know, African-Americans, I mean, you can kind of understand it because African American community, that I, 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 it sounds like a very progressive term for it, the black community, American Africans, Africans who are in America, the African diaspora in America is in a very, very poor state. They have been very poorly governed for at least 60 years. And I mean, they weren't particularly well governed in the early half of the 20th century, too, but apparently it seems like we put the worst of both worlds. Because right now, that community is killing itself with fentanyl. It's dying a demographic death the way that everyone else is. And they're very, very poor. And they live embarrassing lives. I mean, I hate to say this, but that's true. And like, if I'm a black intellectual and I see the state of my people, I'm going to be angry. And it's a very, very easy thing to blame white America. That's the obvious choice for the blame. Unless you're Kanye and then you come to a certain subset of white people to blame. That's a lot. I will say it doesn't play on MTV very well, uh, Kanye's understanding of the particular white group to blame for the sorry state of affairs. But at least that makes sense, right? You know, that, at least that makes sense uh, about the, this, this grievance. Um, what does not make sense or, or at least on, on the surface does not make sense, is the it, it is sort of like these 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 people like Syra Rao and and you know I have, there was a few of them in Berkeley back in the day back in 2015 talk about blast from the past there are a few of these characters from UC Berkeley who were like these Vietnamese and Chinese Asian women who were 120 percent on the woke train just screaming at the top of the lungs total antifa like fuck whitey all the way and. I'm really swearing on this stream, but here you go. And you're, you're looking at them and you're wondering, like, the Chinese community is richer than the white community on average. Like, the the median income for a Chinese American is way higher than the median income for a white person. 
So in your idea of racial justice, like you're going to be given money to like Joe six pack in Arkansas, like from, from your, from your lavish Berkeley stipend sitting here, you know, <laughs> sitting here on telegraph screaming into a megaphone about how white supremacy rule. That's your end state. That's your victory condition. I mean, if you're the race communist you claim to be or Syrah Rao, again, like the most wealthy, you know, and we're, they'll, I'm, certain people on the right wing think they know who the wealthy I mean because of population sampling bias on average by a median the most wealthy group in this country are Hindus right uh, okay Syra so you're you're really really bitter and and in your version of race communism you're going to check the privilege of all these white women who come from a group that is on average poorer than yours uh, but the, the, behind every kind of inexplicable, and this is probably a theme of this podcast. Okay, I think I'm back now. Okay, um, sorry about that. I accidentally kicked over my microphone uh, cord, so hopefully I'm back now. So guys, uh, just tell me if you can hear me. But this is sort of a theme of the show, I would say, is that for every inexplicable moment and for every inexplicable person that's, uh, that has an ideology or a position that you can't possibly explain. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. For every ideology that you can't possibly explain, uh, there is actually a, a very easy explanation, and that is for all these people, like these these Asian Americans and these these Hindu Americans who are very very wealthy and well to do and have really nothing to complain about, either individually or collectively. Uh, some of them are just hysterical women that are kind of at the end of their rope, biologically speaking. I don't want to be too misogynistic about it, but that's obviously what's going on. They don't have enough a family to occupy their time. They don't have enough productive endeavors to actually occupy their time. And so they're, they're doing this useless shit advocating for race communism that doesn't even make any sense or that they don't stand to benefit from if it didn't make sense. Um, but, but what really is going on and that's an unspoken rule board is even with a lot of these sort of what we could call high achieving um, minority groups like Hindus and Chinese who are, who historically have had a lot of cultural achievements who who themselves have done very very well in this country uh, they're sort of vaguely aware that high culture itself is dominated by european perspectives and any attempt to sort of advance high culture implicitly makes them feel inferior and because we're in an irreligious age and it's completely impossible to make good art. The reaction to this dearth uh, of, of a high culture that they feel really embodies them uh, and that they, they can't see themselves in their reaction is to essentially become part of this, this ascendant victim narrative. And, and that's, that's their way. Uh, that's the way of kind of, I mean, it's, it sounds sort of ethno narcissistic in a little way, but that's obviously the thing that's going on. I should say like the third world, leftist point of view at least it makes some coherent sense in both of those regards the 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 mainstream sort of boomer left absolutely does not and, and so every time it goes into dialectic with anything else anytime it comes into conflict uh and it can't just escape it with platitudes and, and with jokes and with with weird with weird kind of irony culture it, it, it immediately kind of crumbles in on itself and what, what does that ultimately get you, though? What does that ultimately get you? Because no one's really figured out what the, the opposite end of this world's going to look like, what, what the, what the post-progressive world could even look like. The question of 2024 is to what degree are people going to have an election, have open dialectic? Because the left wing, the left wing cannot say... In 2024, there is no legitimate debate to be had over who will be president. I don't see how they could possibly say that. They have to at least admit that there is some legitimate debate over who is president. So if there is somebody who is president who advocates against one of the core progressive sensibilities, then that must de facto be part of the presidential debate. This is the question for 2024. Now, 
the and, and this is I keep on saying and this is and this is but I mean this is indeed what I was writing about with a recent essay I, I wrote called The Weight it actually benefits the right to play into the kfab the kfabe whatever the illusion that there is an actual decision to be made in 2024 because uh, the American boomer the American boomer mindset believes devoutly that there is something that is being debated in in 2020 in 2024 that has to occur that has the illusion of it has to occur but every time that the illusion has to occur the reality has to follow it there are always the illusion of dialectic and dialectic itself is more or less interchangeable and that is an opportunity for us and that i think is what should be you know we have put together the seed of something called basket weaving in 2023 in 2024 basket weaving has to participate and grow in the process of facilitating and following the dialectic the fake dialectic but nonetheless the, the simulacrum of dialect that that will be real that's going on in 2024 in real life in conversation with boomer the boomers and everyone else the question we need to assert over and over and over again is is america going in the right direction and who are the right people to take america in the right direction what would an ideal leader look for you what would he say i said i put this question to my a little personal but i put this question to my to my boomer parents who are, who are progressive and I, I said imagine you had my audience and or you just had an audience of young people and i could create i could go up there and i could be perceived as a good leader and they would listen to me what message would you give to them and my parents said the message would be to stop whining. But that sort of implicitly begs the question, and I know I'm misusing that phrase, but you know, I'm, give me some rope here. It begs the question, well, if it's illegitimate to whine, then everything must be going great. I mean, it's election time, right? This is the, de this is the designated year. 2024 is the designated year where we get to discuss changing course, changing America putting things for the better. Uh, does America have a bright future and we're just whining about nothing? Or does the future of America look pessimistic? You tell me. Look outside. Look at where you are right now. And if the answer is no, the, you got to tell young people something other than stop whining. you got to give them some hope. Anyway, the... To go on, I, I, I did want to kind of review a little bit of Twitter dialectics here. I always think that it's it's fun to figure out why dialectic isn't happening. You know, the 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 stream what 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 sort of uh, eclipsed the right wing in 2020, what shut down all dialectic more or less was drama streaming from the left. Uh, I I always find it, and I guess there's there's not really much interesting to say about youtube personally or bread tube i mean it's imploding it always is in the process of imploding <laughs> i know i'm like steve turley right does anyone remember I, I i totally forgot that this person existed but i i did talk to this man in 2018 he was this evangelical pastor of some kind called dr steve turley and uh every single one of his shows which he did every single day would be like this little 15 minute shareable clip where he assured his audience that the, that the Democrats were being totally destroyed by the latest thing that Trump did, and now they're in the process of imploding. And now it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's five years later. <laughs> the Democrats have been imploding every single day for, for every single hour, and, and we've imploded our way all the way to a permanent Democratic majority with lots of Trump's followers in jail, with Trump himself possibly in jail before the next election in 2024, with him possibly him being elected from a jail. So they, oh my God, we can't stop winning. <laughs> we can't stop winning. It's so great. It's so great. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't handle the amount of winningness we have. Um, 
But you know, it, it's fun to look at at these at these places like the these projects. I always think like, okay, psychologically, do I have these people figure it out? I will say this: there is no victory without a dissolving of the left-right distinctions in in America. The, the, the left-right distinctions have to be a functionally dissolved for the next step of this process to take place in any meaningful way. And, and that means that 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 that, I mean, that means that there has to be the development of a post-left in some way, shape, or form. Now, what is that? I mean, post-left looks a lot like just right-wingness. But what it what it means to me is that there has to be a story that carries a certain number of people from the left wing to a political coalition that sees that the, the, the apparatus of the deep state in the West basically needs to be completely dissolved and remade for society's greater good. And this idea of partisan politics has been is completely destructive. The task that, that I have is not to take any like of these ideas seriously, because to a large degree, I mean, I don't think they even want me to take them seriously. Like I said before, the last time I left has tried to convince me was sometime in 2016. Since then, leftists don't try to convince anybody on the right. They 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 pose in front of them. Uh, they 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 debate. They debunk them in real time. Uh, but but there is no attempt to convince, and that's because fundamentally, the the main process of the left is the left does not understand right wing psychology at all. Even people who study it, and this is one of my fascinations with Professor McManus and Ben Burgess, these guys study right-wing ideas. And then they have a very, very, very poor understanding of right-wing psychology. And more than that, right, they, they, don't have, they have no plan of integration. You know, they have no plan. I mean, I'm kind of, I've kind of walked Matt through this last time I talked to them. Like, what's your plan to do with right-wingers? I mean, there, there's no radical change. in you, We can get to 51%. And then just what? Like remake the country over the strenuous objections of 30% of it? Demographically swamp the country? I and mean, I guarantee you there'll be political divisions inside that swamp. Somebody's going to come up with a coalition you don't like, and that's not going to be perfectly aligned to your woke ideals. You can't move forward with a culture war on your hands, but there's no way that, that a democratic political ascendancy occurs without continuous culture war. But there's no plan to convert, there's no plan for conversation because there's no understanding of, of, of right-wing psychology. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why, you know, Brad Tooth fascinates me is because I, I get I get kind of a, a, an insight into leftist psychology. Some people, like uh, this creator I have up here, Thoughts Line, is, uh, is kind of in a low cow of mine for a while. It's sort of like a Bob Chipman, and, 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 and what was it? Andrew, and, was it Andrew Chu? I forget, it was Anthony Chu. I think it was Anthony Chu. Uh, he was one of this, he was a Jeopardy contestant that was one of the original, uh, one of the original um, anti-anti-HWs. He was on Jeopardy and he was one of the anti-Gamergate people from the original crowd. And uh, what was really interesting about uh, this this character, and we, well, this is a pattern we see again and again, is that like he was exactly the person like Bob Chipman? He was exactly the person you think he would be. He's exactly this. He he, he must have had some kind of like deeply bad experience. I mean, I'm sure he did have deeply bad experience with bullies in high school, but this has somehow formed his entire reality. So that the idea of him being like a weak man, it's not just it's not like he's a weak man and then he's kind of hiding it behind. Uh, a, a masculine leftist facade or he's a weak man and now all of a sudden he's discovered leftism as a way of, of kind of um, turning that weakness into a strength or at least pretending like it's a strength or, or hiding it. They've completely internalized this idea of their own masculinity. And um, so these people, these people, they go around and uh, their their favorite target is Republicans, which which their rage just gets completely genocidal about. Which, again, I mean, like short of going full pull pot, I mean, you can demographically swamp this country until you get it to like 60, 70 percent non-white, and you'll probably give Democrats every single election by a hair's breadth. But you're going to have 30, 40 percent of this country that's incredibly hostile to you, a very, very hostile minority. 
And in the meantime, you're going to have political divisions that stop you from implementing your utopia because the entire idea of our modern government is to essentially rob from young people and hand it off to old people, to old rich people. So, so all of these new incoming Chinese and Indians, or at least all the higher earners, they're going to get fucked over royally because in 10 years, our social security trust fund is going to be completely exhausted in 10 years. It was just listening to, I mean, I don't like these Cato types, but I was listening to some of their projections and the, their numbers are solid. Like in 10 years, they're either going to cut these payouts by 30% or the middle class's taxes are going to double or they're going to try to hide it under additional borrowing, like a mass, not just like the incremental borrowing we're doing right now, but a massive quantitative easing uh, that would be unprecedented and, and, and then triggering inflation. That There's no way you can sweep this under the rug. So you're going to fuck over all of these new high-earning POCs. There's going to be a political division here. <laughs> what, what you want is completely impossible. What you want is 100% impossible. And um, this is uh, this is not realistic what's coming up. So so the, the, their main goal these guys is, is to bash is to bash uh, right wingers. They just love it. And you can see after after in 2020 these guys were all communists. These guys were all it's time for the revolution. It's anarchy or bust. After 2021, they all became sort of mod, they all became comedians. What do you mean we're not revolutionary? It's a comedy show. It's drama now. But it's always funny to see kind of what what they keep on kind of returning to. And, and my favorite one of these guys, you know, I think Jay Burden has Bob Chipman, who's really more of a Twitter personality. But my personal favorite one of these violinist archetypes is Thought Slime. Um, I, I don't know what to say about this character. The, the, the person, I, I don't think he really is aware. I mean, this is another thing that people like Zero HP Lovecraft point out. Is this is really the archetype of the young millennial? Everything, and I mean everything, is coded in this layer uh, of performative irony. Uh, everything is like self-deprecating. Everything is like everything is is hacker coffee, or to say his wedding vows if he indeed is married, or or to to just approach someone on the street. It, it's all this. This is serious. Okay. All right, I think we are back. Um, I'm going to assume that this is fine. Um, part of this, uh, one thing I was really entertaining about the hot slime is, I don't think he's really aware of this. He's obsessed with men and masculinity. This is really, really irritating. I don't know what to say. Um, well, you know, it's just be a stream because I can't seem to get the, the internet to work properly. Yeah. It's not Linux. I switched to windows, man. <laughs> this is my internet connection. Okay. Guys, uh, I, I, people are saying back, people are saying, eh, okay, it's fine. Anyway. Um, one of the things about thought slime is that he's genuinely obsessed with the subject of men and there's, there's no way to, to actually put this in a context that makes any sense for who he is. It, it's, he'll, he'll launch, he'll launch, he's, he's obsessed with like men's rights stuff and his, his latest response is not shoe on head. And the problem with all of this is, um, it, it's, it's so very obvious what the game is with Thought Slime. The game of, of Thought Slime is, I'm going to jokely put down all men and then kind of hold up myself up as an example of the one that's the good one. I mean, it's, it, he is that person. He is that person every single time he does this. And every single time what he does is it's supposed to kind of come into terms with what he's doing. He turns it into a joke and he points out the fact that he's white knighting. It points out the fact that he's, he's literally, um, he's literally going behind and doing this is, it's, yeah, yeah I, 
there's nothing more irritating than, than a bad internet connection on a live stream because it makes it impossible to do a monologue because I can't possibly talk when there's Fs going on the stream. But we'll edit this out of the podcast version that I publish to my Substack. Everyone pass me a subscription on Substack if you want to keep these things going. Uh, but he, he really is the, the person that everyone thinks he is. He really is the, the white knight character people used to talk about in 2017. And uh, I guess the idea is that irony makes us all all right. Like, it's okay to be bad as long as you turn being bad into a joke. Uh, he calls his podcasts the weekends, like not strong, like they're weak. He, he constantly tries to undermine his own masculinity. He constantly undermine, he constantly insults himself for being white. He constantly insults himself for being a man. He constantly says on his one hour podcast in between asking for donations that you shouldn't listen to anything he says because he's a straight white man or man adjacent, but he's a straight white man and therefore you shouldn't listen to anything he says, right? Uh, th that, that's, that's his shtick, but, but you're still watching. The show must go on, but but because it's a joke, because he called it out, because he has a little performative irony there, it, it's all right. Uh, so he did one today called "I Have Failed Men" about about men's rights people, men's rights activists, and on particular shoe on head, and and he's wondering too why uh, we. Shuan has saying that we're not inviting to men. We're we're very inviting to men. We're very inviting to men, but men. Are just they're just really really bad, <laughs> and he, he literally says he he he's, he's cl he claims in this video to be inviting to men all, and then then he goes on a five minute digression about how horrible all other men are who don't sign on to the progressive point of view because they're there to defend their privilege even if they don't have any privilege. Now Shuanet says, well, not all men are Jeff Bezos. Was like, well, yes, but they have to accept if they don't accept progressive presuppositions, they're essentially participating in the privilege. So that means they're being assholes like Jeff Bezos, but we're, we're very inviting to men. My favorite one was the Peach Mom episode where, where Thought Slime, he, he, he literally stops. His, so he does this one about the whole Peach Mom thing, which was a, a trope. It was a comic from about eight months ago. It was in early spring of 2023, I believe. And this is a, uh, a, 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 a comic where the the mom is constantly complaining about the husband taking too much for the kids and the example is always like whenever i do something i only have my children's well-being at heart but when my husband does something he only thinks about himself and it's like you think you see one of them and it seems incredibly arbitrary about about whether you save the last peach for your kids or whether you eat the peach yourself. And the, oh, the, the selfish husband always eats, eats the peach himself. He always, he's just, he's terrible like that. He only thinks about himself. You know, he doesn't help out with the groceries. He doesn't, he doesn't help out with the chores. He can't remember where they put any of the, the items for the cooking whenever he cooks dinner. He's just altogether a bad parent. He just puts in a lot less effort. And then Thought Slime says, well, you know, this is indicative of the struggle that all women have to get men to do their fair share because men just don't work hard enough. And that's what this woman's trying to communicate. She's trying to get justice for how much she has to work against her lazy husband. And it's just so hard. And she has to make these web comics, calling them out in the most passive aggressive way. Otherwise women won't be able to get justice for their husband not doing sufficient work. And by the way, did I mention that I'm not like those guys? <laughs> I'm not like those guys at all. I'm a good guy who works harder than anyone else, who, who, who does everything right. And, and I'm an equal partner with my very, very difficult job of making one YouTube video every two months. <laughs> And a live stream on the weekends. I work my butt off for my significant other, who is of an indescript gender. I won't speculate, but I work my butt off. He, I'm one of the good guys. I'm one of the good guys. You know, later, it turns out, Peach Mom in a blog admits that not only does the husband cook all the meals most nights, he also does. He also earns 90% of the household income, which, of course, it would be inappropriate for the husband to ask his wife to earn more money, but it certainly is appropriate for her to complain publicly about her not doing enough chores. So there we have that. But then thought something, well, that might be true. 
but it's indicative of the larger cause. By the way, and he cuts away, and he does this whole segment about how men generally don't prop, don't, don't follow good anal height. He just literally ends this video and does an entire segment, an entire expose on how men, and by men he means all men who are not him, do not properly practice anal hygiene and they stink. Literally all men stink but me. <laughs> and then, but, you know, this is, uh, the thing is like, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. But, but then, this is the important thing to understand about Thought Slam. Is, is like, he anticipates that these pushbacks are going to come. He anticipates, he was like, oh, I guess I'm a white knight. I'll admit right up front. I think all men are bad. All women are evil. And this isn't a jokey way. She's like, okay, that's not what you actually believe, right? I'm aware of the fact that I'm doing this. I'm aware of the fact that I'm participating in this trope of, of, of bioluminism, of, of white knighting, of, 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 of holding myself up as the one good person among another group of completely deplorable people who I will put down in my videos for the benefit of me and the people who exactly resemble me and all of our ideological preferences. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. This is the boogie 2988 thing too. I hate this element about the millennial generation. Why do they do this? Boogie 2988. And there's been recently, there's been revelations about, uh, about maybe he's not as broke as he thinks he is. But you know, supposedly this documentary that came out two weeks ago or something like that. I think I put it on two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, I, we did a podcast where I mentioned it. He does this whole video about how he's broke, he's dying, he's hopeless, and, and nobody loves him, even though he's got four million YouTube subscribers. He's one of the more popular people on YouTube. And he can't make ends meet, and, and woe is him. And then you watch him go through this entire documentary doing all sorts of self-destructive shit from beginning to end and still making out like abandoned, still ending up at the end of the documentary with like a super attractive girlfriend in her 20s, uh, having, having, I mean, still having a YouTube channel with 4 million people and a lot of assets. And, and all the while, all of his actions manifestly harm his situation. Their learned helplessness. There, I'm, I'm going to sabotage myself. I'm going to sabotage my attempt to get a, a job. I'm going to sabotage my attempt to be a YouTuber that people actually respect again. And then I'm just going to kind of wallow in my own misery and, and, and plea for the internet for sympathy because that's the utility is to extract sympathy for people. And, 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 okay, and you can see this is happening. But then, then he confesses it. He goes, oh, I'm a vulnerable narcissist. I am a vulnerable narcissist. I'm aware of this. I, I, and, and so, oh, because I'm aware of this, like I've preempted the criticism and it's no longer valid. This is an irritate. This is such a kind of, I, I don't even know how to describe this behavior. It's such a weak, it, it's sort of it's such an effeminate approach. It's, it's fundamentally effeminate to kind of, to kind of be, a, you're, you're aware of a problem. Once, I mean, men, oftentimes I have found myself like for a day or two going into, I have a depressive personality like most millennials of the internet generation. I have kind of a, an anxiety, depression style personality. And I had little two or three day spouts where I go into like deep downs. But, you know, once my wife makes me aware of that, I, as soon as I am aware that I'm doing it, I'm able to kind of, I, I, I like to think that I, I'm able to kind of snap out of it. And I like to think that as soon as, like a man can have moments of self-indulgence and learned helplessness, but I don't think that it's manly to enter one of these states in, in, in an aware fashion. As soon as you're aware that you're doing it, the only manly response is to snap out of it and, and actually snap back to reality, and however horrible that reality is. It's not to feel sorry for yourself, but millennial men... And I assume the Zoomer men as well, at least of a certain variety, just don't have this instinct. They 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 they, they develop ironic self-deprecation, and they use this to shield themselves from all criticism, and then they just stay in their little hug box for, for the rest. Of, you know, I mean, sure, there's there's going to have to be a rebuilding of a coalition, but but this option has to be taken off the table in a radical way. I don't want 
there's no way that there's no political way to deal with people who do this. There's no political way to deal with thought slam. There's no political way to deal to deal with boogie. There's no political way to deal with with these these kind of effeminate individuals. It's it's impossible. This brings me to another perhaps more frustrating character. I'm about to kick over my uh, cord again. Uh, this brings me to another more frustrating character on on the internet sand that I interacted with. In, in, in a way that I kind of kind of can't believe that this person is a thing. You know, it's always kind of funny uh, when you talk about people like Richard Hanania. I'm not particularly interested in Richard Hanania. The reason I'm not, I'm not interested in Richard Hanania is it's so obvious he's a grifter. It's so obvious what Richard Hanania's game is, is to kind of be Steven Pinker 2.0. It's to kind of say the edgy thing, but not too edgy so that you're outside of political discourse. And to, in the meantime, shit all over the mainstream populists and dissidents who are making up the majority of the community so that you can portray yourself to the establishment as being potentially the only good guy who sees what's actually going on. Uh, there's something that Richard Hanania has really ever said that Steve Saylor didn't say first and better. And there is no grift that Richard Hanania will pull off in the future that is not going to be better than the grift that Steven Pinker has already pulled off. We already know all quantities involved with Richard Hanania. I'm not particularly curious about him. I am very fascinated about James Lindsay. <laughs> I am very fascinated about James Lindsay because the guy is an absolute moron. There's no, I mean, I don't, know what to say about this man anymore he's an he i mean i i mean people can people free i mean he's he's a math phd he must have some amount of, of intelligence i mean but his, his understanding of what it means to think is so fundamentally unhinged that, that i can't even really process it and, and it's not like really him like i understand the grift I understand that people like Vocal Distance are deeply invested in this whole liberal project and they'll do anything to stop it from di being disrupted. But I feel like Vocal Distance and even Adam and Sitch insulate themselves a bit better than James Lindsay does. Like nobody who's listening to James Lindsay's podcast is going to is going to be um, should be. I don't, I don't know how you can listen to James Lindsay's new discourse podcast be reasonably aware about how ideas work and, and still take this man seriously at all. The, the, the first thing that kind of took me off about this, and this is kind of a minor thing, is, is his sort of take on people like Hegel and, and German idealists. And I've done this too before in the past. Like I was, a con, I was in the whole conservative sphere. You know, I read a little bit of Hegel, incomprehensible. You know, I, in fact, I have, I have the book right here my philosophy shelf, right? Actually, I have all three of the books here. I took out, took them out here. Now, I read this book. Yeah, yeah, the show and tell. Show and tell. I read this book. It's Hegel's Reason and History. I couldn't make... I probably made got a few insights out of this, like when I read it. So there's a few sentences that stand out. But I put the book down like I have no idea what I just read. I, I, I had to read a summary of Hegel to figure out what this book actually meant when I read it. And I was not... I don't think I'm a stupid person. I don't think I'm a stupid person. Uh, I, and, you know, this is always the joke about Hegel. I'm reading, um, I'm reading a Carlyle book, which is equally comprehensible, incomprehensible right now, although I am thoroughly enjoying it, called Sartre Restartus. Or sorry, Sartre Restartus, the Taylor Retailored by Thomas Carlyle. One of the most, I, I'm convinced it's the, it's the, it's the premier postmodern book. And I'm going to write a review on that later as an essay, hopefully. <laughs> Everyone subscribe to the Substack because that helps me out, but that's my own plug. I have to, and, and of course, um, Carlyle is a friend of Goethe, or translator of Goethe. I think Goethe was a much older man, though. Uh, they had a correspondence, though, which is very interesting. And, and uh, one of the things that was happening at this time was the German idealists, and, and Sartre Resartus itself is kind of a parody, like this long-winded German intellectual that has this esoteric theory that makes absolutely positively no sense. It, it, like it, 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 it's history as explained by clothing. It's history as explained by, it, like it could not make sense. And yet like the joke is that like weaved inside is some divine wisdom. And, and that's, that's why sort of, it's a postmodern pun. That's, that's kind of the, the point. Um, shift here. That's kind of the point of the book to begin with. Um, 
fine. You know, they're, 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 you, you approach Hegel as a conservative. If you read it, you're like, oh, this guy is, this guy is bad. Or this guy, or this guy is incomprehensible. Then you read Marx and Marx is a little bit like you can sense. I was like, I have a very poor opinion of Marx. Have I read every single thing Marx wrote? No. Do I have no admiration for his writing style? I think he's a fairly good writer. You know, he's good. He's, he's very compelling in certain areas. And he certainly believes what he's saying, which is, you know, that's the, the mark of any good philosopher. He feels passion about what he's saying. And that's what, that's what I look for. My bad opinion of Marx comes from the fact that I know Marxists and I know how they read Marx. And I find it irritating and self-destructive and destructive to the larger body politic and our larger ability to actually have political discourse in this country. And I can't help but try to trace these flaws that I see in Marxists back to possible origins in Marxist theories. And indeed, I have two problems with Marx. I mean, first of all, on the sort of Hegelian side and sort of the German ideology side, I fundamentally disagree with this presupposition of materialism. I think materialism is the great philosophical problem in most of these schools across the 19th and 20th centuries. I thoroughly disagree with it, but I feel that Marx particularly abuses it because he cross-applies it to Hegel, who quite plainly is an idealist. So he, he's superimposing one idea onto another where it's obviously not suited for that. It's obviously not suited for this. And... Um, and as such, it's um, it seems like it's 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 it has a problem with it, and so I, I kind of justify my bad opinion of him that way. Uh, I have to be humble, though, right? It's like so when I approach a book, I'm looking for when I when I, approach, when I, when I see Hegel. So I, I maybe I'll back up here. As a conservative, I was briefly kind of convinced into hating Hegel an author who I did not particularly understand because of his influence on Marx. So even when I had a very, very little uh, understanding of this philosopher, I, I really didn't like him very much. And I, I, there's a lot to dislike about Hegel because he's incomprehensible and he influenced some of the worst ideas in the entire world. But I think what's sort of not often said is that how influential Hegel was on other great thinkers that I deeply respect, like Heidegger, like like other people in, in 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 the modern era that that are that are that they have incredibly brilliant contributions, and that that draw. I mean Spengler. I mean Spengler. I don't think Spengler claimed Nietzsche as an influence. I don't think that he directly cites Hegel unless I'm misremembering something. But he obviously draws on that school, and and Spengler's a great you know a great thinker. I have no right to put down this author in, in terms. I I feel like I should be very careful. I should say yeah. You know, put down. I'm, I've already put them down by saying that he's incomprehensible and long-winded. You know, that's already put down. So I guess I can put him down. But 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 I uh, my intellectual humility requires me to always prefer understanding over condemnation. And it absolutely, what intellectual curiosity absolutely compels me to do is to take ideas and then understand them in their strongest form. What actually causes people to believe these things in the modern world and who is believing them. When I pick up something like Hegel, what matters to me less is like the long Byzantine bibliography chain that leads from Hegel to Bell Hooks or that leads from Hegel to Paulo Fiere or that leads from Hegel to Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw or whatever, right? The, the bibliography that links one to the other is really immaterial to me. What I care about is, is what is it about Hegel that causes his ideas to be powerful in the minds of people who either either who I either respect as luminaries or who I respect as enemies? And any any powerful enemy is an enemy that you must respect by the mere virtue that they have power over you and could defeat you. So I I owe it to Hegel, to Hegel's impact on other thinkers that I respect to give his ideas a certain amount of charity and to certainly not roll him into some kind of story about how everything was screwed up in a long chain of bibliographies that stretch back to the early 19th century uh, rebellion against classicism and its, its transformation into romantic uh, perspectives in the 19th century. 
that's that's ridiculous. That's that, that would be that's fundamentally anti-intellectual to me. But you you read Lindsay, and and, and if you read Lindsay on Hegel, Hegel's like he, he's like a Captain Planet eco villain. He manufactured like Lindsay has this diagram. Like he's like oh the Hegelian dialectic. I mean first of all I know there's always some smart ass in the chat whenever I say the Hegelian thesis and antithesis coming together for the synthesis. That is the Hegelian dialectic, and someone goes. Um, actually, that's Fichte, not Hegel. And actually, Schelling created more of the fundamental ideology that led to that theory. Like, just fuck off. I know that this is all German idealism. I know these guys all went to the same schools in Prussia and they cross pollinated like mad. Everyone understands that idea of dialectic history as Hegelian history. And, you know, James Lindsay has this whole diagram where he's like, the, the left works by instituting a dialectic where you tactically concede their ideas and then they get their way overall strategically. And, uh, you know, and, and, and this is part of a conspiracy with the World Economic Forum to, like, take over the world and institute a social credit system. And the way they're going to do this is to do dialectic history where they can use the political forces going back and forth and then, like, somehow come to all power through this dialectic. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's completely abusing what Hegel meant. Hegel was talking about... Hegel was not talking about the machinations of some cabal of, of, of leaders like the World Economic Forum planning out how they're going to take over the world or accrue more power to themselves. No, I'm not going to say what the World Economic Forum is and is not doing in present year. I feel that, uh, if anything, 2020 to 2023 have disabused me of the idea that conspiracy theorists are always wrong. But it's beyond my pay grade to comment on how much power these people actually wield. But... This idea that Hegel printed a, a strategic blueprint that Klaus Schwab is executing, like like in his little computer, like, ha 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 ha! Now they will they will participate in the antithesis of the thesis and become the negation of the negation, which will complete the system of German idealism and lead to my world domination. Ha ha! Now I've destroyed liberty. Uh, this is silly beyond belief. I mean. And you literally see him spin these these tales about this stuff. I mean, okay, great. Like, what what is the thing that's moving the Hegelian dialectic? Like, is it the world? Is it is it some organic force like the Zeitgeist, or is it the World Economic Forum, or is the World Economic Forum equivalent to the Zeitgeist? I mean, obviously Hegel meant some organic spirit like the spirit of God or the zeitgeist as one of the German idealists, I'm sure coined it. I'm sure it wasn't Hegel's originally, <laughs> but his idea was that this process was an organic proceeding of history. His idea was to understand how ideas proceeded through history organically. That's why his thing is called reason in history, how reason organically moves throughout the ages. It's a taxonomy of how ideas are formed. That's why it's German idealism. It's the science of ideas. Uh, and this is obviously why I think Marx's application of materialism is questionable, but you know, we, that's, that we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll take that out. That's not something that I can go into in this, in this, in this stream. And, and I, I probably have ulterior motives because I, I hate collectivism for other reasons, uh, not simply it's misapplication to, to uh, you know, other theories that I don't fully understand if I'm quite honest. Uh, but but Lindsay is is abusing Hegel, like transparently abusing. I, I don't know Hegel, but I know enough about Hegel to know that Lindsay is abusing him in his dialect. And he's abusing him for the exact worst reason. He's not teaching you about Hegel. So you get really, really curious about Hegel and read Hegel and understand exactly where he's wrong. He's also not teaching you about Hegel so that you can look at some progressive and go, oh, I know what you believe. You believe in the negation of negation and the movement of reason and history and the zeitgeist. So now I have this way of communicating with you and coming to your point of view in a way that better reflects your passions so that we can move together and create a better political future that's the embodiment of us or at least conduct war in a more honest way and in a more uh, insightful way. I now know my enemy as he knows himself, which is the objective of all thinking. Uh, Lindsay's description is useless for that purpose because it's it's a narrative. Lindsay's description of Hegelian dialectic is is no leftist is thinking that they are pawns of the World Economic Forum. 
even the people in the World Economic Forum don't think that they're creating this master plan that's going to steer history in a Hegelian way. And you know, but okay, and it, you know, it's it's obvious, and this this is just, this really sells to a certain like this kind of, and then always, of course, with Lindsay, are are the labels. He loves labels, and his go-to labels, as everyone knows, are Gnosticism and Hermeticism. Hermes, I forget, it was Hermes of Syracuse. It was some mystery philosopher from the late Roman Empire, which we name uh, Hermetic ideas that are kind of. We, a better word would be like esotericist or mystical philosophical ideas, mystic knowledge. Now, it is indeed true. And Lindsay is obviously, again, First Things Magazine and a variety of thinkers were drawing comparisons between Gnosticism and progressivism for decades. He's not the first person to figure out that these that progressive ideas in their modern form, much less so in the 19th century, by the way, Leftist ideas in the 19th century resembled Gnosticism not at all. They were very confident. They were very material. Hermes, is it Hermes of Syracuse? Am I right about that? Okay, I don't know. I don't know. This Hermes is somewhere. Okay, just, just give me a break. Um, but but I should say, I derail myself. The, the thing with Lindsay, and, and this is... um. No, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, Gnosticism and Hermeticism. Uh, indeed, they resemble modern progressivism. They don't resemble 19th century communism, which was materialistic and optimistic, but they absolutely represent the sort of body-denying world pessimism, world weariness that we see in modern progressivism. The, the idealism above all else. This is a thing. But the way Lindsay uses this as nuts. He's like, okay, I've exposed it. Progressivism is just Gnosticism, Hermeticism, dialectic history, World Economic Forum, debunked. Okay, but it's great that you've come up with a historical resemblance to Gnosticism, Lindsay. That's not what's going on in the mind of the progressive. That's not what's psychologically occurring in their mind. That's not... That's not the story of their lives. That's not what they're telling themselves. They can discover these ideas this way. And, and the resemblance of these modern progressive ideas to stuff that comes from like the Nag Hammadi scriptures or earlier Gnostic texts in like the 6th century Rome, that's completely convergent evolution. Now, if we're Spenglerians, we could talk about the civilizational forces that lead to that resemblance, but there's no direct line between these two ideas. It's completely coincidental. But no, it's, it's just a label. It's a label. You slap Gnosticism on this thing, and it, it somehow you, you somehow accomplish something by doing this. Not by understanding. Like, Gnosticism doesn't expose a weakness of these systems. It doesn't describe how these people believed in these systems or how they've come to believe these systems. It doesn't describe anything about them. It's just a label. He just throws the label on there. And now what do we have? We have hot garbage. We have hot garbage. And... The thing is, is that this, this is kind of a shit, and you could tell, and I've talked to people who eat this stuff up. They, they eat this stuff up. Uh, oh my God, he's, it's almost like the Turley audience too. I mean, it's, it's a step up from Turley, but it's almost the same thing. It's this very repetitive cycle of analysis that always ends up with the same, like the Democrats are always imploding in Steve Turley's world. And our globalist masters are always exposed as Gnostic Hegelians in James Lindsay's world. And that's like that's always the conclusion. That's always a Scooby-Doo ending. You always reveal it and, and see and see see that, that you've exposed a person and you don't really know what you've accomplished. But as uh, as far as I'm uh, I said that like I said there's an audience that eats the stuff up. They they like they like the fact that I think I think they like the fact that it sounds smart and that it sounds educated. And that Lindsay is, I really wish I knew what it was about Lindsay's style that appeals to a certain, I, I associate this type with sort of red America more than blue America and more than the culture that I've grown up into. Because the way that Lindsay projects himself just to a person of my cultural background screams fraud. It screams like you have no idea what you're talking about. You're posing as an intellectual. You're spewing out jargon. 
you have you have no idea of the ideas you're trying to wield. You're, you're, it just screams it from the top of your lungs that this person is not serious. But certain people just eat this stuff up. Okay, well, this... Lindsay's shtick works really well with Gnosticism because nobody reads it. And if they do read it, they don't understand it. And it works well with Hegelianism because very people read Hegel. And even the people who do read Hegel don't understand Hegel. I've had PhDs who haven't understood Hegel, who've done their PhD in Hegel. It's not comprehensible. So you can put a lot of bullshit can be fit into these concepts. A lot of bullshit can be fit in these concepts. But I think, what was that? I think James Lindsay this week got tired of his old shtick, his old runabout with, with Gnosticism and Hegel and the rest of the German idealists. And he decided to latch on to a new takedown. And uh, that was, uh, he discovered, discovered a new, a new villain, a new villainous continental ideology that, that insidiously has created, spawned leftism, created leftism. It weeded its way through the university systems and it created all of the wokeness and it inspired the World Economic Forum. And now it's the World Economic Forum's plan to deliver this horrible ideology. And the horrible ideology is Catholic distributism. Oh my God. I, we exposed Klaus Schwab. It's the Scooby-Doo ending, guys. It's the Scooby-Doo ending. It's the Scooby-Doo ending. We take Klaus Schwab, we pull off a search mask, and we get Hegel. But oh no, we're too smart to fall for that. What's behind the Hegel mask? Oh my God. It's G.K. Chesterton. It's been G.K. Chesterton the entire time. It, it, it's J.R.L. Tolkien. It's C.S. Lewis. It's Hilaire Belloc and the rest of the conservative Christian group from the end of World War I. They've all come together in a big conspiracy. They were a bunch of books about how society ideally would be organized into small communities where everyone owned their own properties and where families would be the primary holders of political power, where tools would be centralized into these small hamlets and where, where, where all organization would be around churches and be around local marketplaces, the way that Tolkien imagined it, the way that you know, more political people like Chesterton and Belloc imagined it. This would be a return to, to before the institution of the servile state. Hilar Belloc wrote, wrote an entire book, I have the book right here, The Servile State, you know, about how primitive medieval societies captured a level of autonomy that was destroyed by the Industrial Revolution and the implementation of capitalism. You know, Hilar Belloc famously said, I, maybe this could be Chesterton, he said, capitalism is a crime against property. Because property is fundamentally about the worker owning their tools and the community and the family owning the destiny of their peoples linked completely with their culture, with their land, and with their church, and with God and the spiritual world. Oh my God. That's exactly what Klaus Schwab is saying. That's exactly what Bill Gates is saying. That's their, that's their plan all along. They're trying, to, they're trying to implement a distributed society. They're trying to make the world a bunch of small agrarian farmers and small communities <laughs> and deeply religious people who have deep connections to their history and their past like the medieval peasants did, like Hilar Belloc imagined, a, a French hamlet looking, or like G.K. Chesterton or Tolkien would imagine an English village looking. That's exactly what Klaus Schwab means with his 50-minute city, guys. It, it's quite simple, right? It's quite simple. You see, because the distributists wanted to distribute money away from large banks into farmers and small business owners, and because medieval peasants didn't have cars and lived very close to each other in little villages, then distributism is like confiscatory managerial socialism and capitalism. And the 15-minute city is the equivalent of your small, quaint English village. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's that simple. How didn't I see it all along? How didn't I see it? Uh, my God. <laughs> it's, 
It's so stupid. It's it, I, I, James Lindsay went on for 15 minutes talking about how Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and the globalists wanted to implement Catholic distributism on a grand scale. This is their master plan. This is their plan for the world. Six months ago, James Lindsay said that conservative Christianity would have an atom bomb dropped on it if they dared say anything bad against transsexuals or homosexuals. It would be January 6th all over again. And there, by, come August, the, the Christian right and the distant right would be destroyed as a political movement. They no longer would exist. <laughs> well, guess what, James? It looks like not only does the Christian right, there's not only did the Christian integralist right, not only does it has it survived the atomic bomb being dropped on it for its own homophobia, somehow we managed to become the establishment of the globalist organizations. In that short period of time, we went from being a group that would be imminently destroyed by the machinations of the deep state to being the deep state itself. <laughs> Um, this is, this is all bullshit. I don't even think, I mean, I don't even think James Lindsay, I mean, I think this should finish James Lindsay. I'm sorry. I mean, he's, he's practically blocked everyone in our circles, but what, what is he going to say after this? I mean, you know, what is he going to say after this? You can bullshit about, and lots of the people back in the day, like in, in, in the National Review era, Pagel, in the National Review era, Hegel was a favorite punching bag because Hegel influenced German thinkers that led to Hitler and he also influenced communism. So if you were a, if you wanted to do like the horseshoe theory thing with communism and fascism like all writers wanted to do in the 90s who were conservative, Hegel was like the perfect punching bag and you could bullshit as much as you want about Hegel because no one was ever going to stand up and say I understand Hegel with another expert saying, um, actually, you don't understand Hegel, and that was Fichte, and that idea comes from Schelling, and blah, 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 and I know German idealism better than you. No one was ever going to call you on your bullshit. And so James Lindsay, I thought, felt he could get, could get away with, with, with naming, uh, with bullshitting at what Hegel said. Um, the same is not true for Chesterton and Hiller Belloc. And, uh, you know, our friend Pope Leo the 13th here. I mean, James Lindsay traces uh, distributism correctly to, uh, to this pamphlet. I highly recommend everyone read this. This is Rerum Novarum, written by Pope Leo the 13th. He correctly identifies this as a bibliographic source of the ideas of distributism. And, um, but here, here's the problem, James. You know, like, look at this book. This is Hegel, right? This is Hegel. I I um I open it up and, and the, the text you need a microscope to read. And this is owned by a college student. Uh, some of these markings are mine, but this is not my handwriting. This is the previous owner. And, and all of it is his notes in the margin of him trying to figure out what these words said. Uh, very hard to read. Um, you could never figure this book out. It's rare of Navarum. This is 60 fucking pages, James. 60 fucking pages. And these words are big enough to be in senior bold type. My grandfather could read this book without his glasses. And in more, less time than it took him to drink his tea. I read this book in a Catholic group that read Letters of the Pope. And we read it in one fucking sitting. You're not going to bullshit people about what's in this book. Anyone can pick it up and read it in their spare time. You think you're going to find... Klaus Schwab's Great Manifesto to make a globalized world where no one has power to own their own tools in this book, or maybe in this book, which virtually every other Catholic who's serious about politics has ever read, you'll find the exact opposite. Everyone has quotes up the wazoo to talk about how distributists emphasize, above everything else, the property of the individual and the property of the family, as held sacred against the dual threats of capital and the state, both of the forces that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum want to represent and unify under total managerial control. I'm not concerned about the fact that you pulled this bullshit. I'm not, it's so easy to call you. Anyone can read these books. Anyone can understand them. Anyone can quote them. Anyone does quote them. <laughs> it's like someone bullshitting you about the color of the sky. You can just go out and look at it. 
points. <laughs> oh yeah, this one says Rare Navarum is the greatest lost teaching uh, in the last hundred. I mean, it's it's a fairly popular book. It's you know of all I don't is it technically is it is it a letter or is it an encyclical? I'm not even so sure. Um, but it's a uh, it's a great little read. I mean, it's not it's not like going to change your life. It's not really very clever. It's a little bit dry, but how dry can you be in 60 pages of big senior type? It's simple. You could stand up here and read it for, like I could just literally read this for one of our basket weaving events. It'd actually be kind of fun. Uh, th this bullshit can't stand. It's, it's also like, it's the perfect, it's, it's the perfect, uh, I mean, this is what sort of ends Lindsay now at this stage. Like, okay, it's like, Lindsay's utility, like the, pe the reason people liked him is that he actually read. So everyone knows that this is the leftist thing, right? And and, and there, this is the sole... Does anyone remember that show Portlandia? Where, where like, ContraPoints did this skit too. It's the best skit that they ever did. And the, the Portlandia thing is like, well, did you read the article in the New York Times? Well, did you read the article? Did you read this article? Did you read the article? And these two insufferable progressives sit down. And all they ever do is they ask each other, did you read it? Did you read this? Did you read that? Did you read that? So so, so when the other person says, oh, well, I didn't read that. Like, oh, well, you really should. You really should. I read it and you didn't. I read it and you did it. And all they're doing is cycling through all of these things, trying to make sure that they checked off all the boxes. Uh, this is every insufferable leftist does this. Every And it, what's so funny is insufferable leftists know they're doing this. Uh, Portlandia was, this is a show that where well, leftists made fun of themselves before the Great Awakening. It was the last funny thing the left ever made, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, and you can see them making fun of themselves there. And later, ContraPoints steals this bit. Like, the, their anarchist character, they just like, did you read this? Did you read this? Did you read this? Oh, you didn't read, the, like, did you read Did you read Marx? Yes. Did you read the, the German ideology? Yes. Did you read Das Kapital? Yes. Did you read Das Kapital Volume 2? Yes. You read Das Kapital Volume 3? Oh no! Oh well, look, you're not well read enough. Go back and do your reading. Like that's that's the, the that's the shit they always pull. And and James Lindsay's utility, or the way he sold himself at least, was I am the guy that read the books. Like you, like we we all know, wokeness is anti-white. It's pretty fucking obvious. But I'm the one, like in, in the get-up clause. Well, the the, the, the anti-white actors, they're just dumb kids that don't know their stuff. And James Lindsay says, well, I'm the one who read the actual books, and I can set the exact page number where Bell Hook says an anti-white thing, or where Derek Bell says the, the bad thing, or where Kimberly Crenshaw says the bad thing. Uh, and you're like, I have the goods on them. I'm the reliable source for the bibliographies, guys. Your intellectual artillery has arrived. You're welcome, right? You're welcome. The intellectual artillery has arrived. So let's call them all out on their bullshit. If I were a leftist, I'd be laughing in my boots right now. Like, okay, okay, James. All right, James Lindsay, you're gonna tell me. You're gonna tell me what Bell Hook says. Bell Hooks is anti-white, is she? Is Bell Hooks anti-white in the same way that Klaus Schwab is a fucking distributist? <laughs> in the same way that the World Economic Forum is trying to implement the ideas of J.R.R. Tolkien, really? Like I can just, it's it's bullshit. Like I can equally dismiss anything he says as bullshit. It's a fundamental lack of curiosity. I I, I don't know. Uh, you know, this is. <laughs> I I think the utility of this is like really. I, I think James Lindsay just has to be done to figure out <laughs> as a, as a low cow maybe he'll go on, uh, but I I don't know exactly what's serious must be taken from this thing at all. I, I, my one mystification is why so many people buy this. And and the only thing that kind of made sense to me after a while about thinking this is James Lindsay is an intellectual sh a, a hicklib. Like, what, what's the hicklib? The hicklib is somebody who comes from a red community. And what what characterizes them is that they're deeply, they're, they're aware that red America is less cool than blue America. They're deeply aware of, Red America is being less cool than blue America. But as opposed to sort of defend their own people and their own interests, they try to hop on the bandwagon of blue America. Sometimes they copy over the tropes of um, their old red American identity. So this this gets you to the whole Yellowstone meme where you've got like the the guy the, the you know the, the guy in the pip the cowboy in the pickup truck sitting looking off in the distance and thinking, yep, yeah, sometimes what a man's gotta do. 
Sometimes a man just got to drive his son to the gender reassignment clinic so he can get his balls cut off. That's just a hard choice that men sometimes got to do. And I'm a cowboy. I can make those hard decisions. Yeah. <laughs> it it, it tries, to, tries to recombine the virtues of the old with, with the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 it's trying to combine old time America with, with all of the moralistic platitudes of blue America, even though they're obviously in contradiction with each other. They obviously don't go together. They, 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 they don't go together well at all. They, they, they completely implode each other's narrative framework. Um, and, and the thing is, at the first, the Hicklev is kind of pathetic because the two sides contradict each other. But what really makes the Hicklev pathetic, from my point of view, is that he's hopping on the bandwagon after the bandwagon's already caught fire and crashing. It's too late to profit off of this. If you're a Hicklev in the 1990s, like, or the 80s, like, if you're a Hicklev in the 70s, you're gold. As a matter of fact, Garrison Keillor made his entire career on NPR by just being a giant hicklib. Prairie Home Companion, and I love that show because I love folk music and I love monologues and I love radio plays, but it's freaking hicklib variety hour for two hours. That's all it is. And it's insufferable. Even though it's it should be good, it's Hicklip variety for two hours. But if you did this in the early '80s, like yours and Keeler, like you were fucking made. You had an in to the in group because they were ascendant. But progressive America has peaked. There's no more room on this bandwagon, so you're jumping on to a bandwagon that's already caught fire. There's there's no way that this can pay out. And everything like that, is, like Lindsay is the same way, like. And it's always this idea, like, hick library is the intellectual cargo cult. It's like, well, liberals did this, so if we do this, we'll get cool like the liberals do, or like the progressives do. No, and this is the same thing true with James Lindsay. Like, James Lindsay is the believer in the intellectual cargo cult. What do intellectuals do? They read a lot of old books, they come out with heavily documented bibliographies, and then they append their political opinions at the end and decide who's good and bad. That was the pattern of leftism. And that's like, you know, that's why I always accuse people like Ben Burgess and Matt McManus. They don't write actual writing. They just write bibliographies with their opinions inserted at the end. Like there's no chain of logic or new logic. There is just like so-and-so said this, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. Now here's what I think. And there's no any, there's no, there's no revelation they're just they're just leftist pledges, and they're entirely constrained by by the moral perspectives of 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 the liberal progressive world. James Lindsay is is similar in the sense that like he writes long bibliographies, and then just inserts his opinion at the end. And, and there's this weird idea that by writing an accurate bibliography, like it's almost like the the ancient idea that if you name the idea properly, you have control over it. Where the modern academic idea is, if you can properly ch like strain together a chain, a bibliography, that's like the perfect bibliography of the idea that you want to debunk, then you can debunk that thing. Like you can you can defeat that thing. But that's not true. I mean, you can deconstruct it, but deconstruction only has teeth if you've got power. And this this whole idea that like this this intellectual perspective gives you some kind of gives you the goods on these systems is nuts. The reason why you study an ideology is to understand how your enemy thinks and to understand your proper relationship to that person to to affect the most political change you possibly can. I study thought slime because I want to know how thought slime thinks. I study Hegel because I want to know how the people who were influenced him by him think. Although I haven't read Hegel in a very long time and I have no desire to again. Because I think I'd much rather read Thomas Carlyle for my share of incomprehensible early 19th century prose. But you do so for understanding. I guess this brings me to the next thing. Oh, this is... You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of um, a little bit the, 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 the joke of uh, the Arbuckle Chronicles. Where... where um, there was a joke back in the in the uh, in 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 the uh, this is very much a millennial joke, 
But the uh, the the joke on the Arbuckle Chronicles was there was this guy, this intellectual professor, and he's really obsessed with the, with Garfield, <laughs> like the, the comic strip, and he does this incredibly serious thesis about like historical rationality is 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 described in this first comic of Garfield saying that he hates Mondays or feed me. And, and he reads into it so deeply. And this is kind of like the, the attitude you, you go with James Lynn's like, I'm going to explain to you this deep esoteric truth. And, and in this esoteric truth, there's going to be some political realization. It, it's really kind of funny. This is almost, James Lynn's is almost Gnostic in this regard and that he somehow believes or seems like he believes that just saying the idea or providing a bibliography of it or providing deep analysis uh, gives you some kind of power over the idea beyond how those ideas actually sit in human minds, uh, which which is what we're dealing with right now. I mean, I, I'll i read Marx, but the way Marx's ideas sit in Marx's mind is very, very detached from how Marx's ideas sit in modern Marxist minds. There's a kernel of similarity there, but it's fundamentally different. The same thing is true for, as I discovered this time, um, the same thing is true for, 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 oh, I want to discuss this one, one, one thing too. Um, before, before I, before I go, there's this one, before I get off Lindsay, right? There's, there's one thing that kind of always mystifies me about the centrist types. What mystifies me about the centrist types always is the horseshoe theory. Okay. The horseshoe theory. I mean, People make fun of this and they keep on coming back to it. It's very, very obvious that distributism is the diametric opposite of global managerial techno capital. They, they couldn't be more different, but James Lindsay asserts that they're the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. They're just the right hand of the left. That's all they are, guys. They're the right hand of the left. I've always tried to figure out why right wingers, uh, why centrists are so fixated on the horseshoe. Why do all of their uh, enemies have to be not simply wrong in different ways, but wrong in the same way? The only way I could think of, the only reason, the only way this makes sense really, is, or I mean, I, the story that makes sense is they obviously just don't want to debate the right wing. The horseshoe theory is there to stop you from actually engaging dialectically. It's, it's, it's the liberal, liberals can't just be like the right. The, liberals can't be like the right and say, oh, it's a noble lie. We have to ban some things. Get out of here. They can't be like the left and say, You're, this is a microaggression. This is oppressing horrible people. Get out of here. You're not allowed to speak. Centrists also are not benefited by dialectics. So there has to be some way for them to dismiss right-wing ideas without actually addressing right-wing ideas in their full form. And the horseshoe theory is the way to do this. And the way you do this is say like, well, guys, look at these superficial similarities between distributism and global techno-capital. Global techno-distributists want to live in villages. Techno capital call their vision the global village. Village, village. They're the same. Distributists want to distribute money away from banks. Techno capitalists want to distribute people's resources so that they own nothing and everything's owned by the government and corporate infrastructure. They're the same. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, well, they both wear hats, they both drink water. They're the same. They want to do this so that they can only dialogue with the left and then convince everyone that they simultaneously refuted the right at the same time. When these ideas really have no resemblance to each other in any meaningful way, the similarities are all completely superficial and everyone can see that they're superficial, but they have to above all else preclude dialectics with the right. A lot of people who I know who like James Lindsay have told me that they were surprised at how, Vocal Distance performed in my discussion with him on Benjamin Boyce's channel. Why were they surprised? Well, they were surprised because they thought that they'd have better answers to these questions 
than they actually ended up having. And, and they didn't. Um, they didn't because they couldn't be honest about what they actually believed. With, 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 I mean, with, if, if we were to take these people and, and ask them what they honestly believe, uh, they would say, I want to go back to the 90s. I want to go back to the way things were in the 1990s, and I want these hard questions of identity to go away. The problem is, is that there were certain problems that the 90s presented to us. Unsustainable spending, an unsustainable global economy, uh, an educational system that was churning out progressive ideology, uh, promises about how multiracial societies would function, promises about how new forms of family organization would function, and all of these problems were unaddressed in the 1990s. To go back to the 1990s, you'd actually have to solve any or all of those problems that I just listed and several more that were looking, lurking under the surface. They can't solve those problems, and so they will never go back to the 90s. And the only alternative is to essentially play back 90s-era liberalism in the 2020s, when all of their enemies are wielding the full power of the state against them, and everyone knows already how that battle will go. It leads nowhere, and everyone will also know that they have no ability to motivate or justify a broader perspective on human existence or aesthetics. All they have is platitudes about liberty and choice. And no way to entreat people to reach for the true, the good, and the beautiful. But they still believe liberalism is true. And so they have to have a way around the dialectic proceeding. They have to freeze it. This is probably the most embarrassing conversation I've ever gotten into into my entire life. King Crocoduck and Gad Sad. I, I don't know what to say. This is sort of the flip side of the coin. James Lindsay is a liberalism, liberal in denial of liberalism's death. Gad Sad and King Crocoduck are political realists. I would say that they're nationalists. Pretending to be liberals because they don't know how to make their worldview work otherwise. What they're telling me is not liberalism. This is Gad Saab, the defender of anti-identity politics, no identity politics allowed in this space. But maybe that doesn't apply to Jews in Israel. And he keeps on retweeting things like this, like, he retweets and endorses this. Jews are simply better people than almost all other cultures. And this guy goes on. This, this Cromwell dude goes on. This might be a joke if I didn't see Gadsad literally endorse this on his feed. And I, the guy deleted his tweet. But it's like, Jews are smarter. Jews have produced more culture. And I agree, Jews have produced a lot of culture and they have done a lot of scientific contributions. No argument there. And it gets on to, Jews have never done a bad thing. They've never participated in any kind of atrocity. They have never uh, advocated for any kind of, of bad government. They never spread bad ideas. Their shit doesn't stink. Uh, flowers grow up around their feet, blah, 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 blah. It's ethno-narcissism throughout the entire thread. Uh, no awareness whatsoever. And then, you know, Lauren Chen, Roaming Millennial, this is 2023, you know it's weird when Roaming Millennial is calling out the JQ, literally juxtaposes this with Godside's other statements about being anti-ID pool and asks them to explain this massive incoherence that's going on, this massive shit stain of incoherence that's right in front of all of our eyes. And, and there is no explanation, but but I get into this bizarre conversation with King Crocoduck. And I don't think, King, obviously I don't think King Crocoduck endorses this level of ethno-narcissism, but there's a similar line of thought. This line of thought is, oh well guys, this is just how everyone feels about their nation. Jews are just a nation. Okay, that's awesome. Jews are a nation. 
Well, they're not a physical nation, right? Because, I mean, Israel, not all Jews are is in Israel. And not every person in Israel is Jewish. And they're literally not even treated like Jews. Like they have special laws for Jews and non-Jews in Israel. They, 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 they literally keep, keep track of this. Their immigration policy keeps track of this. If you want to chain migration somebody in and you're a Jew in Israel, you'll have a lot easier time than if you're uh, a Marianite Christian or if you're a Sufi Muslim or even if you're Arab of any variety. Okay, so this is crazy. This is an idea that like there's this eth there's this indefinable ethos that is Jewishness that that is eternally valid that's eternally beautiful and some people can take it too far some people can be like this one guy Cromwell who who, who gets too proud but that's what everyone does everyone gets a little bit too proud of their country what about all those hicks back in America going, America is the greatest country in the world. We kicked everyone's butt in every single war. That's the equivalent of that. It's much more like that raw, raw, Rambo, America first guy than it is like any kind of racial supremacism. Because being Jewish isn't like a race or an ethnicity. It's just a nation. Okay. Well, what's my nation? Crocodile's answer, oh, it's America. <laughs> okay, it's America, except America is a passport. Anybody can be American. Anybody can't be Jewish. My grandmother wasn't American. My father wasn't American until I think like the 70s when he finally got his citizenship. My wife isn't American. My in-laws aren't American. I'm a new arrival in this country. Furthermore, to the extent that I have any culture, it comes from elsewhere. At the same time, to the extent that I'm participating in ordinary American culture as we know it right now, the Somalian that just moved in next door to me is as American as I am. He's got the passport. He speaks English. He has corporate sponsorship. American. Is there a difference between these two things, King Crocodile? Okay. What? What ethnos was my grandmother? Is Germany a real ethnos like Jewish? Well, maybe. King Rocket is very skeptical about this. Oh, well, I don't know. It seems suspicious that Germany has a distinct ethnos of its own variety. I mean, Jews have their own holidays. Do Germans really have their own holidays? When was the last time you heard of a German holiday being celebrated in this time of year? There aren't German holidays celebrated. Not, certainly not some kind of fest that's celebrated in October, very stereotypically. Not to, mention, not to mention, I can think of a number of holidays, especially around this time of year, around saint days, around special Catholic holidays that had particular significance for German Catholics that my grandmother used to celebrate. And there were special occasions. That's all everyone ever did in my grandmother's hometown back in what's now Serbia. All they did was go around and have various little folk celebrations so that they could get together and use it as an excuse to drink and play cards and gossip about each other. Because that's all there was to do. There wasn't any television back in the day. Oh, well, we don't have any... play. Well, 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 well I don't know, German, that sounds really weird. I mean, you're, you used to mean the people inside Germany. My grandmother was never a citizen of Germany. They never lived a day in Germany. Well, okay, okay. Well, I mean, if it's just German people or Germanic people of ethnicity, how can you distinguish them? Is there a difference between them and Swedes? Is there a difference between them and Iberians? I mean, where do you draw the lines? It's all so superfluous. How could you possibly keep track of this? It's, it's silly. It's silly. It's all, it's, it's this endless 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 nitpicking of these categories and of course like oh well we, we might allow germanists but we can't allow pan-europeans why do you care the diversity the difference between a swede and an iberian is less than the difference culturally and ethnically speaking than between an ashkenazi and a sephardic jew and certainly between an ashkenazi and an ethiopian jew Groups can have a large variety of, 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 of different kinds of identities and, 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 and different kinds of expressions. <laughs> I just think that we, 
the problem is we can't this is the thing like we can't be honest about what we actually want I mean look and I'm not stupid here like I'm not stupid I know what King Crocodile wants what King Crocodile wants he won't say he wants this he wants me to acknowledge the universal salience and preciousness of the Jewish identity and the fact that it imminently needs to have political representation and military political representation with absolute sovereignty to pursue its own interests. <clears throat> but he does not want any kind of sovereignty will wielded by any nationalist interest that is not Jewish or that he's not part of. There can be multicultural identities like America that are strictly attached to a passport. There can be unicultural identities like Swiss or, I don't know, Bavarian that are sort of niche and that can't possibly be organized into any kind of power coalition. Certainly not one that people in a diaspora could participate in. But there cannot be any kind of Gentile particular national identity that wields sovereign political power for its own ends. And he can't say that I know that's what he wants to say. And what he wants to say, what he's worried about is he's worried, I'll say this again, he's, the problem is the lie. The problem is the lie. I sympathize with Kern Crocoduck. I know he didn't create wokeness. I know he's against all this anti-white stuff. I know that this isn't his fault. I know the shitty situation he's, he's, we're in is not the fault of conservative Jews, right? But this is the situation that we're in and I know what he fears. What he fears, and it's, it's not like he's fearing that if, you know, Poland or Germany or Fr France all of a sudden came up with this idea of Germanic or Nordic identity and everyone in America started feeling super proud about their, their German ethnicity and wanted to pursue a German homeland and a Swedish homeland and so on and so forth. He's not actually worried about mustache man coming back and, and, and swarming Europe with panzers. He's not, he's not worried about the Holocaust or, or the flames of Auschwitz or Dachau. He, that, that's never going to happen. That, that was a part of a particular time period. There's a, there's a, I, I do agree with Curtis Yarvin here. Like the, the mass democides were part of a particular historical moment where the violence of the old world came in contact with the technological aptitude of the new technological world. It required one key input, which was World War I veterans that were totally psychotic and willing to do anything to actually obtain victory. Totally desensitized to the levels of violence that they were commanding their younger troops to participate in. That's what was required by uh, for those democides either of Stalin or of Mao or of Hitler's to occur. And of Roosevelt's and Churchill's, if we're being quite honest, too because they're guilty of mass democide as well. That was part of a particular ho historical moment, and I do not think that King Cro Crocoduck is worried about that. What they're worried about is for some kind of ethnic identity to become very, very popular among European Gentiles, them suddenly wanting to have their own spaces and to have their own sovereign orders to pursue their own goods, and then asking, oh, wait a minute, why can't we have this? My grandfather had this. My great-grandfather thought it was a right to have this. Why, why can't we have this? What, what happened? Who, who convinced us that we should give this all up? Who, who are the culprits? Who are the villains? How can we construct a bibliography like James Lindsay? If you were to construct a James Lindsay bibliography that would show all the bad kind of Hegelian type guys that led to the state where Europeans can't pursue their own sovereign nationalism anymore. Uh, who would the names be that would appear in place of people like Hegel and Fichte and, and, and the rest of the German idealism that, that James Lindsay always blames for everything wrong? Well, they would be a lot of names that would have some commonalities that would be very, very it would tell a very uncomfortable story. To say the least, a very uncomfortable, I and mean, I've seen this story told by other people who are further right than me. It's not a comfortable story to hear, and it would immediately suggest bad things. Now, a responsible leader 
who was in charge of a country could make sure that the truth could come out, that people could reclaim their homelands, and that there would not be some kind of historic recrimination against innocent people of the ethnicity, of the same ethnicity, of the people 100 years ago who kind of got this ball rolling a little bit. We could assure that everybody's interests were aligned, but of course, King Crocodile would, would never trust someone to do that. And, and I wouldn't trust him. I wouldn't trust him to do the same. I wouldn't trust him to be like, oh man, dude, bra, just, just, just acknowledge in this moment. Like, I, I'm sure like his solution I, I apologize. I should keep the the. <laughs> well, I'll edit this out in the final version. So anyway, um, I, I I know what they want here. I mean, I know what they want. You can now hear me again, right? I, I know what they want. Yeah, I, people are saying good now. Um, so I, I know what they want. He want a sovereign could ensure that uh, a sovereign could ensure that that everybody that that, that, that the, the recriminations would would stop there would be no kind of further looking into uh, that that essentially people would be able to pursue their own sovereignty without mass recriminations going on that everyone could get what they need but he wouldn't trust me to do that and i wouldn't trust him to ensure, I, mean, I remember the '90s. Like, okay, trust us, man. Trust us to acknowledge that that German identity is illegitimate and does not need political representation in any sovereign form, and that Jewish identity is legitimate. And then just trust us to make sure that this anti-white stuff doesn't get totally out of control. It's um, it's frustrating. It's one of the reasons why I think democracy ultimately can't work in this situation. A sovereign could fix this problem, but democracy cannot. The one thing I think that I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to talk about here is, is this is the last part of the talk, the things they carry. I... There is one kernel of truth to King Crocodile's statements about German culture and the diaspora and American culture, and that is it has fundamentally not maintained itself. It has become deracinated. And that is not the fault of some other ethnic group. That is the fault of Americans. That is the fault of modernity. That's the fault of irreligiosity. And I know there's bad actors who are pouring gasoline on the fire in the James Lindsay sense, but as we know from James Lindsay, hopefully, that bibliographies don't create social problems. People create social problems, and people with instantiated beliefs create these problems. And the beliefs that deracinated America were not this anti-white globalist crap that you see coming out of universities. It was comfort. It was television. It was the American way. It was all of the good stuff. Hopefully everything is back now because I see, I don't see any more messages in the chat. It was all of the good stuff that, 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 that got us addicted to being deracinated and indolent modern people that tricked us into learned helplessness. I mean, who made thought slime? Thought slime. Not... Not the elders of Zion, <laughs> not Noel Ignatiev, not 
anybody usually who who's usually blamed in far right circles, right? What made Thought Slime Thought Slime is the modern world, is video games, is bad education. And bad education not because, um, I mean, maybe now bad education is bad because it's ideologically poisoned. But bad education was bad back in the day because it was too hard to actually be able to teach people to care about things that matter. Because it's difficult. Here's a good example. I talk a little bit about, well, we talk about, about, about the patterns of the holidays. One pattern of the holidays, now I, I do intend to write an essay about this, so I'm going to keep this a little bit more brief. Clothing. I had this tweet that kind of went mini viral about how President Bukele in El Salvador wasn't as well dressed as previous Latin American strongmen. And it was funny, he's re I was like one of these garbage tweets that I tweeted like just as I got up and I was having my morning coffee before I went to the, you know, do a hike with the family. And I just blew up. And, uh, but, but I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's kind of profound. I mean, like it, the way I know Bukele is somebody who could potentially mean business. I don't know if he's a psych, maybe he's a psycho, right? Maybe all of this is just for show. But a critical part of what gives me hope, hope about Bukele is how he holds himself. Confident stride, masculine posture. He is the father of a new El Salvador. He is where the buck stops. He is taking things in hand. And how he dresses communicates that. Now, he doesn't dress horribly. He dresses very well, but he isn't dressed with the... You know, he isn't dressed with a wardrobe fitting of a king, of, of a new father. He isn't dressed like Santa Ana. He isn't dressed like... He isn't dressed like uh, Perón. He isn't dressed like Pinochet. He isn't dressed like Franco. And so it always feels like he's still a caretaker. He's still a CEO. And the board could fire him at any time. But he's at least partially there. One of the reasons, you know, there was a new election just after that. The new prime minister in, in Argentina, how to pronounce his name. It's uh, Javier M Milai, I think is his last name. I might be pronouncing that. I have zero hope that this person's going to do anything. I mean, he talks a good game. He says he's going to completely abolish the Argentinian government and restore the country. The guy dresses and acts like a complete lunatic. He communicates no gravitas. In fact, the exact opposite of gravitas. He communicates instability and inconstancy. And I, I say that having my internet connection go out once and, and my mic go out twice because the cord fell out. But he communicates no, con, con, uh, no constancy, no responsibility. He looks unstable. Maybe he'll get rid of a few agencies. I can't put it past him. But I know that nothing serious is going to be built on the back of someone who, who acts like that because the only thing that can be built, I mean, it requires more than just essence to create a leadership and, and the, the, the instantiation of something new. It creates, it requires form. It requires a pattern. Gad Sad and Craig Crocodile, when they attempt to deny that that being Germanic is the same thing as being Jewish. Well, do you celebrate? What do you, is there, is there a piece of cloth that you wear because you're German? Is there a, are there festivals that you celebrate because you're German? Uh, are, are, are there practices you have for weddings if you're German? Like these are all superficial things. The, the real thing, that if, if there was an essence of, of Germanness that wasn't just the blood in, in people's veins, it would be about being orderly and warlike and romantic and, 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 and pessimistic about the future while at the same time always laboring for that which is beyond the horizon, being Faustian, as Spengler would put it. Although that's a more broad quality of the civilization, it reaches something of an apex form in the German romantic imagination, 
which is why Goethe's Faust is the pinnacle. Of, and I never read that in German. <laughs> I don't have, my German's not good enough or never, never good enough. It's gone now, even though like four or five years in high school or whatever, between high school and college. And, and of course, like grandmother spoke it sometimes with me. Um, you know, that this is, uh, but, but this was the, this was the essence of being German. Another essence of being German was Christianity or maybe Christianity that's tinged with a little bit of pagan German ideas as is often argued by the pagans. Uh, you never know. This is the Christianity of Carmina Burana, where you have pagan deities under the larger superstructure of Christian theology, which I think is the, the, the closest to the German essential soul, as you will find. That's the essence of being German. And God knows I have thought a lot about it, but how much does it mean if I don't wear the clothes? If I don't celebrate the holidays, if I don't carry forward the form and the banner of these things superficially, well, I can feel German. I can read Faust. I can read Schiller. I can listen to Beethoven. I can love all of these things. Indeed, I do. Uh, more so than I think God Saad listens to Yiddish music or Sephardic Jewish music, or King Krakatuk does, right? More so than I think they ever meditated on the philosophy of Jewishness that are both atheists. They don't even follow the religion. But they follow the form. And the form carries you through. The form is what bridges the gaps in the spirit. The spirit undulates. The spirit is what's alive, the spirit is what goes up and down from moment to moment and that makes people truly brought to their moments of greatness, it defines them as an individual and as a people. But the form and the clothing and the ceremony, that gets you through the hard parts. That gets you through the parts where the spirit has failed you and you wear your clothing like armor And you wear your practices and you continue them, even though you don't know why you're doing them. You keep on doing them because you know that someone else valued them in the past. And like Hegel, I don't understand him, but I know that there's something there that inspired other people who I admire. Like Thanksgiving, I don't like turkey. But you can't change it. You can't change it. Clothing and ceremonies are the promises. Spirit is the fulfillment. And the promises exist even if the fulfillment is in question. <clears throat> the last thing I want, and the reason I said I had this, the sort of theme of this being things they carry, I think a, a prophet of our age is going to be Marie Kondo. Because we are all at this moment tightening our belts and trying to figure out the things that are going to last. If 2022 taught me anything, it's that our decline is continual and will be going on for quite a long time before anything changes. And we have to start building and saving. But it's not going to feel like building in the 1990s where you're building a stairway to heaven. It's going to feel like you are taking your possessions and moving out of Gomorrah, like uh, Lot and his, his, his three, or his two daughters, I guess. <laughs> his wife, who, who, who stayed behind. It turned into a pillar of salt. That's what you're building right now. And you're trying to figure out the things that are worth carrying. The forms that are good that are solid, that, that feel real, that give you joy. For those people who don't know who Marie Kondo is, she's a, the living archetype of the Japanese mindset, the most Shinto mind imaginable. She's a cleanup guru who asks people, she says, the, the reason why people's lives are in disorder is because their spaces are in disorder. And the reason why people's spaces are in disorder are, is because they have two much stuff. You just have too much shit. So you've got to get rid of half of your shit so that 
not only does your house become organizable, you can become spiritually cleansed of the past. And in a very Shinto moment, what she says is she says, you, you have to take everything, you know, you have to take every single object and you have to look at this object and say, Rerum Novarum by Pope Lou, do you inspire joy in me? Hegel's reason and history, do you inspire joy in me? And if it doesn't inspire joy in you, you have to take the thing and say, you have served me well, Hegel, reason and history, but now it is time for me to let you pass to another out of my life and throw it away and leave it behind history. <laughs> you're literally, it's like Medeber Totor, you're literally thanking the spirit inside of the thing. It's the most, the most Shintoism to make yourself as clean as a Japanese person is literally what Marie Kondo is selling. But Marie Kondo is what we are going through as a civilization. We have to look at the things around us, culturally speaking, and invite them to inspire, join us, so that they can come with us, or to leave them behind. The things that we carry will be the new America. The things that we carry will be the new Christianity and the new church. However long it takes to procure those things, the form has to be preserved in the moment. People want me to do a Thanksgiving episode and talk about what I was thankful for. Uh, I couldn't. I said, that's a great idea. My wife suggested I do that too. I said, that's a great idea. I can't, I can't think of the things that I'm thankful for. I, I can't do a podcast on that. Like, that's not what the internet doesn't want to hear what you're thankful for. They want to hear what you're complaining about, right? They want to think about what you're complaining. They want to know what you're, what's wrong. Um, I, I'd say I'll, I'll start here at the end of this thing. I'm thankful for the fact that, that we have this moment, that we, that we, in some sense, have passed through the greatest mass delusion of all time and have come out relatively unscathed. The people that are killing themselves right now are killing themselves. They're not being killed by the system. Seed oils and, you know soulless office jobs notwithstanding no, no one's forcing this on us the suit it's mainly suicide at this point and we we've avoided the people here the people in our communities if they have not completely avoided it are taking steps to avoid the call towards greater cultural and biological suicide in the future i'm thankful for that i'm thankful for a community that seems to actually be coming together in a very small way. The green shoots that have long been prophesized are now visible. I'm thankful for things like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving will re will outlive America. Will outlive this iteration of America. The certainly this iteration of the Republic of America, since there's been a few of them, at least by Yarvin's reckoning. This Thanksgiving is a sacred moment, a sacred piece of American holiness that will not die, will not die as long as the people don't, because there's just something so special about it. And it can't be modified. It has to be consistent in form. For It has to be turkey. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't even like turkey. I'd prefer if they had a goose or a duck. That duck is my favorite meat. And it's it's the same thing, except it's fattier and doesn't dry. And it's much easier to cook. It's much harder to screw up than turkey. But it has to be turkey because the form has to be preserved. And it it should be the best turkey that our technology can procure. It should be the best recipe, the most caring turkey, brought to the highest level of perfection. But that form needs to be in place as a symbol of what's going. And the turkey is the perfect symbol. It's the American bird. It's the bird that is unique to America. The bird that was going to be on the flag of America before we decided that we wanted to be cool like Rome and have an eagle, have an aquila on our badges as opposed to a giant fat bird. And I appreciate that a little bit, even though I don't think of myself as American, particularly culturally speaking. But Thanksgiving is the sacred meal is the turkey. That is the tradition. That is the form. 
Now, if, if it has to be modified, it will be modified. But the form is important to carry on because the form communicates the thing. It communicates the practice of worship, of gratefulness to our existence as thinking and feeling beings. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to know that there is going to be things that kind of carry on into the future and that we will be able to preserve and that there are people who do want more and who aren't satisfied with being entertained and who aren't satisfied with what the world has to offer and that want godliness. Uh, God knows I haven't achieved it. But I'm grateful for the chance to be part of a community that's actually trying and that I think, God willing, will succeed, even though we're probably going to have to come through quite a year of tribulation. And with that, that will be the end of the lecture portion of this podcast. And I'll see you on the other end. Hark, gentle listener, are the woes of the modern world getting you down? Isolation, atomization, alienation. Oh no! But a new approach to the internet and social connections is coming to the fore. A place to meet quality people undaunted by the challenges of modernity. A space for new and better conversations, unfettered by the bounds of wokeness. For those men of quality, gumption, with a can-do spirit. Introducing basket weaving. Basket weaving, a new craze sweeping the nation, bringing quality people together. Basket weaving is not an organization or a club, but a practice. Basket weaving takes social media connections and makes them real, forging the trust so long frayed by our decadent clown world. How do you start? Simply join one of our inlet servers, look for the channel that corresponds to your locality, and begin interacting with people who want to work together locally. Regular meetups are occurring now all across America and many non-American countries. So fight the modern poison with your fellow listeners to build new organizations, new friendships, and eventually a brighter future. guys i'm coming back uh i need to answer super chats because it's later than usual as usual so i'm gonna go the entropy link is in the description um and we'll go just up them uh, as we usually do nerve and vmaker for ten dollars usa i can't stand Lindsay and hanania i appreciate the economic growth miracle as well as anybody but when the richest country in the world has a suicide rate so high that it reverses the life expectancy curve, first time since the Industrial Revolution, then GDP is no longer tracking with real well-being. Yeah, I know. And this is this is something that Michael Anton raised in the Claremont Review. It's like, can you just give us a statement about what the state of America is? It's bad, right? Like, that's what we have to acknowledge first and foremost, that we are in a bad state as a country. And... And without that acknowledgement, I don't know, we're still, we're still going to chase, I mean, they're, they're chasing GDP because they're trying to escape the debt bomb that's going to completely destroy the middle class in about 10 years. In about 10 years, middle class taxes are going to double or there's going to be massive inflation or they're going to cut Medicare benefits in half, which is never going to happen. Uh, yes, I I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I think this is kind of, um, 
that that that's not something that you can overcome with GDP, because quite frankly, our growth is, as far as I can tell, is going to be limited for an, another epoch. <laughs> I don't think we can grow the way we grew in the Industrial Revolution. I don't think that's possible. And everything is based on this idea of infinite growth, including all of our social security systems. So uh, I, I don't know what to say. It seems to be nuts. Gray smog. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the GDP, though. Gray smog for $3 USA. Do you think we will ever invent immortality? I think it would be the worst technology to ever exist. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be. I mean, longevity, because obviously there's going to be a heat death of the universe. So you couldn't live longer than that. Uh, you could probably won't be able to live longer than Earth either. But I, I really doubt that it doesn't seem like they're anywhere close to just curing aging, which would be the the thing that they, they operatively want to do is just to invent immortality and make sure no one ever ages. That seems like it would, it, relative to what I've seen, they're nowhere near doing that. I can't say they'll never invent a technology. You can never say never about technology. That's one of these things. This is one of the reasons why coming up with a way to align AI is impossible because you can never align AI against another innovation AI may, may make upon itself. So the thing is either not self-modifying or it's not aligned. And, you know, this is also sort of similar to Curtis Ar uh, Yarvin's argument about why AI will always have slave will, even if it can mimic thought in some regards. But yeah, I, I agree. I, I think this is not, you know, it would be horrible technology because it would mean that human beings would essentially have to be remain frozen in aspect or they would have to be ruled over as mortal beings by an elite immortal cast like in Warhammer 40k. It would, be, it would be very gruesome, absolutely, to have mortal and immortal mortal humans at the same planet. Gray Smog for $3 USA. Why is the evil Superman trope so popular all of a sudden? And why does it suck so hard? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm aware of evil Superman from like the boys, like Homelander. There, I mean, And there was always a trope of the evil Superman from millennial humor because Superman is such a, a Boy Scout. And we don't believe in that anymore. So it's just natural to kind of make him evil and make that kind of a, a subversion of the trope. Um, I don't know. I've, I've heard that their first season of The Boys was good. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. That's not much of an answer. I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew more about these evil Superman so I could comment on it. All I can say is that I, to me, the evil Superman was always the most interesting expression of the Superman trope. Potentially because some Superman was always a representation of America. So maybe by the evil Superman trope, we are saying, oh, well, the idea of America turned out to be evil. And now we need to turn on on the, the idea of America itself. I mean, America, uh, Superman was developed by a, a Jewish comic book writer to represent literally the American way. And, and, and in many ways, Superman is is... I mean, if you could read it this way, it's a parable about Jews signing on and believing about the American dream. Anything is possible in America. Therefore, you know, when, when you come to America, like Superman in his time capsule, you know, in the old country, you were just a normal person. But you get to America and you're a Superman and anything is possible with Superman. And Superman believes in truth, justice, and the American way. Now, evil Superman represents that the American project has gone fundamentally awry and needs to be destroyed. But how can you destroy America when you've given it all the power, when it has all the power in the deep state? Yeah, that's also why Superman doesn't make a ton of sense after the 1960s or after Watergate, because no one can believe in sort of a truly good uh, America. They always have to, even when they support America, it's always kind of ironically and cynically. And, and the earlier iterations of Superman didn't have any irony attached to them. Asteroidal Assassin for $3 USA. How does one cope with not being able to get married? Well, um, I mean, if you're a young guy, I think you can always hold out hope for getting married. I didn't get married until I was in my mid-30s. You know, that's that's pretty old. Uh, if you're just not going to get married or you think that it's not in the cards for you, uh, I mean, I have some of the 
best people in my entire life have been priests. And priests make an enormous, I mean, they literally are the carriers of our faith, the carriers of the body of Christ. Uh, they're, they're the heroes of Christendom. And, and even if you discount clergy, there are a number of people who made enormous contributions with not having children and not getting married. I think the first step about not getting married is just a kind of decent or sex in your life. That's always kind of the Catholic prescription, right? Uh, the, the, the Catholic prescription is to have, um, uh, it's first to kind of let go of sex and say like, okay, I'm going to have decent or sex in my life, but then also learn not to hate women. And, and that, that's why all truly great priests love the Virgin Mary because they kind of, they let go of the possibility of romantic relationships with a woman but they're kind of re-enthralled to the divine feminine in the form of the Virgin Mary and learn not to become misogynists. And so if you can master that state, then I think you will be fine with not being married. And in fact, it could make you stronger to not know women in a sexual way, but to know them in, in a divine way and to truly dedicate yourself to the betterment of men and mankind generally. That's my suggestion, although it's very vague. Grace Mock for $4 USA. Should someone get plastic surgery if they're insecure about their appearance? I am really, really, really against plastic surgery of any varieties. Um, you know, this was... I uh, heard about this thing. Um, I shouldn't talk about my preference in women ever because I'm a married man. But... Uh, you know, there was, there was a, a girl in, in, um, in, uh, I knew in grad school and she was Korean and she had a very Korean face, like, you know, very heavily slit eyes. And she said she was one of the only people in her family that hadn't gotten plastic surgery because all the girls in Korea get plastic surgery to give them kind of, not like Caucasian looking eyes, but eyes that look big like a Caucasians without having kind of like the very definitive flap, right? And uh, the, like everyone gets the surgery in Korea and so they, they've completely taken and, you know, I, obviously I kind of, you know, prefer Caucasian faces, you know, but, but at the same time, like her Korean features were brilliant. I like people who look like their own ethnicity, even if by Hollywood standards they consider this to be a bad look. Another thing, like Regina Spector and Natalie Portman, like they're both Jewish women. I kind of like how Regina Spector looks because Regina Spector looks Jewish. And like, why do all Jewish women in Hollywood look like Natalie Portman? Well, maybe because they're getting plastic surgery. That's a possibility. You know, and, and it's, it's tragic. I mean, you should feel good about the way you look. And if you have a disfigurement, or a disease, I think that's an appropriate way to use plastic surgery. Especially if you're a guy, unless you're really disfigured, your appearance is probably not the actual problem. Probably your issue is with confidence and with self-expression and with how you hold yourself. A good wardrobe will do you more than a good plastic surgery. And it will also give you more interesting things to talk about. Asteroidal Assassin for $5 USA. Class can just isolate itself from consequences and the lower class can, and the lower class easily. Poverty and the evil concept that poverty should be allowed to exist must be eliminated. Yeah, sure. Is that, is, 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 is like, is people, is socialism just people not being poor? Is, is that just what socialism means? The problem with our modern day poor is not that they're not eating. The problem with our modern day poor is they're not working. Modern impoverished people in this country often eat themselves to death. They kill themselves with drugs. The lower class in this country do most of the crimes and oftentimes they have really nice stuff because their disposable income all goes towards the superfluous consumeristic crap or it's just stolen. Their problem is not like a check from the government. The problem is motivation and pride and exercise and the ability to hold themselves properly. That's their issue. 
And does socialism actually give a people pride? Does socialism force people to take care of themselves or create structures where they have to work and have to hold themselves with a certain amount of dignity? It doesn't. So for that reason alone, socialism can't be the entire answer. And I'm certainly not going to give socialism credit for just being not, like, the state of not being poor is called socialism. I'm sorry, I'm not doing that, right? <laughs> Gray Smog for $3 USA. Let's click that one again. Why is sci-fi, aliens, laser guns, and spaceships repeatedly entering fantasy series? Wizards, Ultima, Heroes of Might and Magic, D&D, &D, time and time again. Uh, repeatedly entering fantasy series? I mean, I don't know. They're probably running out of ideas. Everyone's running out of ideas because no one wants to interface with the actual reality as it is. And that's why we're running out of ideas and stories is because there are a number of stories that we can tell. We just don't want to tell them. And, and so we have to recycle these tropes from 30 years ago and lasers and spaceships and all that stuff are one such trope. And yeah, they're probably just running out of ideas. Although, I mean, like, obviously one of my favorite settings, Warhammer 40k, is simply the fan the Warhammer fantasy setting superimposed onto sci-fi. So it's not like that's never worked before. So if they had inspiration, it might work. Angry Agor Angry Argonian for $15 USA. Hey, Dave, I've watched your videos for a while now, and I'm impressed with your knowledge on economics. <laughs> I've never made a single video on economics, okay? What are good resources to learn more about the subject? Also, any thoughts on Pol Polini's work, The Great Transformation? I've been interested in it since I was referred to it by Why Liberalism Failed. Well, I never read The Great Transformation, so I can't answer that question. The only economic books I ever read were Hayek, A Little Bit of Mises, and then I read some arguments by Keynes when I was in college. And was, as does Marx count? I remember mean, Das Kapital, but that doesn't pass. I've read, I've read parts of, uh, or I got halfway through Adam Smith in high school. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you can take a class on economics to learn. I mean, you're talking about macroeconomics. I mean, you can just get things like here behind me. I have a... Uh, like here, Progress and Poverty by Henry George. I read a little bit of this. It's interesting enough. The problem is it's all super speculative, and I don't know how much of it you should really trust, to be quite honest, because all of these things are built on models that that aren't, strictly speaking, you know, very transferable and in highly uncertain changing circumstances with technology. So I'm afraid I don't have very many recommendations on that front uh, that would be very useful to you. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for the super chat, though. It, it really does help me. Gray Smog for $3 USA. What do you think of veganism? Is it better to be vegan? Uh, no. I I think that it's better to eat fewer carbs and it's better to eat more protein. But nothing in my examinations of veganism have led me to believe that it's all a healthy lifestyle. In fact, you might struggle to get enough protein. And unless you're like a bodybuilder and you're really, 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 really forcing yourself to eat veggies all the time, the temptation to just fill up the calories you lose from proteins and dairy with carbohydrates would be overwhelming and that would be an utter disaster. So I haven't seen any evidence that veganism is good. I think, you know, maybe replacing some meat with some vegetables could help because that's always good. I, I try to eat a salad for lunch every day because it just really helps me. Helps me get vitamins in that I wouldn't get otherwise. And vitamin deficiency is something that I think a lot of people are suffering from. Hunter counts for $5 USA. Anton pulls out a quarter. He flips it, covers it with his hand on the table, then lets out a big sigh and says, It's over or we're back. Call it. Call it, friendo. <laughs> I tried to do the voice there. Yes, this quarter has been waiting... This quarter's name is 2024. It's been waiting 2,024 years to be in this place right now. And now the year, new year is here and it's either all over or we're all back. And you've got to call it. Okay. Well, good joke. Uh, good movie too. 
Asteroidal Assassin for $3 USA. Every day I curse the fact that my parents left the Middle East. I couldn't have been uh, I could have been in the Iranian army all in preparation for the war against the American Empire to get martyred in 72 virgins. Well, uh there's that. Um uh I didn't know she had believed in 72 virgins. I thought that was a Sunni thing. But um yeah, I, I wouldn't relish war against the American Empire. Uh, we may be cucked as all hell, but we still got tons of drones and tons of bombs. And uh, I don't know, getting killed by a robot doesn't sound like a very noble death, although all deaths in war are noble. Uh, ben White for $5 USA. Hi, Dave. In a previous stream, you mentioned how many Chinese Americans you met were mercenary. But are they wrong to do so? They see these institutions around them crumbling in the days of working at one company until retirement is dead. Yeah, I mean, being mercenary is a completely rational way to process the world we live in. I just say that J Chinese cultures tend to be more mercantile than Japanese cultures, which tend to come from a more warrior tradition. And there's a difference in cultures that way that I find rather noticeable. But uh, I mean, yeah, if you're here from China or India... Why wouldn't you just grab the bags? That's the obvious best choice to make. You'd be stupid not to. I can't fault these people for grabbing the bags. I want to grab the bags. It's completely understandable. But I mean, you know, it's it's completely unforgivable that we've we've actually just put our country up for sale like this. Ben White for $3 USA. Why not just make whatever money you can while the going is still good and save it for the good of your own family and community? It seems like many of the distant communities should be doing. Yeah, I agree we should be doing that. I think that many people are trying to do just that. We have to be sort of insular. And, you know, we've had discussions with the Franklin about this, about what he says. He says, like, um, uh, the Benedict option, or well, I forget what exactly he calls it, but take everything out of the system you possibly can because the system is going to collapse and you are going to be stuck paying for it. And in a defect-defect equilibrium, you cannot do anything but defect. Now, there are boundaries to this as a Christian, as a believer in God that you can't cross, you can't lie, you can't cheat, you can't steal, but you can pick up pennies that are left on the ground. You can raid the community coffers if there is no rule against that. And if it's all going to be wasted anyway, this is a precautionary measure. And you should be equitable in, in that pursuit. But I don't know what other response there can possibly be. Happy Thanksgiving, Dave. May God bless you and your family. Thank you. Also, I can just imagine Dave trying to red pill his California liberal relatives about elite theory by quoting Mosca and Smith. I get, I jest. Well, yeah, not this year. This year I'm staying home. Dreadnought for $5 USA. Dave, this has got to be one of your funniest streams ever. Thanks for making me laugh. I hope you, Helen, and yours have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Well, thank you very much. Sam153 for $20 USA. For delicious turkey, happy Thanksgiving. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sam153. Nerve and Maker for $10 USA. Speaking of Chesterton, I just read The Everlasting Man. His chapters on the Punic Wars, where he cast it as a war of virtuous pagans against demonic worshippers of Moloch, is a stunning piece of historical writing. In reading it, has one, it, it, in reading it, one really believes that mankind almost fell 2,300 years ago. Yeah, and this battle between the, the demonic gods of the Orient and the sort of neutral or prefiguration gods of sort of uh, I, the classical world, I should say, is something that it was certainly the imagistic inspiration for Tolkien's uh, Easterlings and Haradim fighters that supported Mordor. Uh, that was very much a copying of that. If you're wondering why all of the bad humans ride elephants in Lord of the Rings, it is almost certainly due to this betrayal in The Everlasting Man. Now, I really do like this lens to look at the Punic Wars through, but it does like, you know, G.K. Chesterton's highly didactic version of the Punic Wars is something that I appreciate, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, but I also handle it very skeptically. 
because I know that history is very, very seldom like that, where it's just, it's sort of like a demonic force versus an angelic one. Uh, you, you know, true history has a more nuanced flavor to that. But I, but I definitely think that Chesterton is right because Everlasting Man was in turn a response to H.G. Wells' A Brief Outline, which portrays a similarly kind of didactic and simplified uh, sort of shit version of history where everyone, it's all just material conditions going back and forth. And, and it doesn't, you know, this is, it, it, it literally is the prefiguration of the Reddit brain view of how human history works. And as a refutation of that, I appreciate the Everlasting Man a lot more. Um, ancestral Ties for $5 USA. Hey Dave, I recently started a YouTube channel exploring the history and traditions of the American people and made a couple of video essays. Do you have advice for getting started on YouTube? Well, uh, use Twitter to cross promote, get on other people's channels to cross promote because that's going to be how you pick up most of your audience by finding other people who like your stuff through people who are already established on this platform because God knows, or I should say, uh, goodness knows that the algorithm is not recommending new creators anymore. The algorithm in 2023 sucks. It is completely focused on privileging people like Mr. Beast and other sort of spectacle people. And intellectual content and dialectics just are completely de-emphasized. And so you need to go to X, you need to go and talk to people like Jay Burden and maybe Alex Kashuda and get interviewed there. And then, you know, once you get interviewed in a few places like this, you'll build a reputation and, and build a following that way. But it sounds really great. I actually agreed with Antelope Press to do a review on their series on American folktales. So I'll be looking for that. Uh, Society Man for $3 USA. Lee Kuan Yew was probably the greatest statesman of the 20th century. He also dressed very plainly. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true, but I think that Lee Kuan Yew was very much a technocrat. He very much was in this idea of, I'm just going to use the best practices to fix Singapore, the city, as a discrete managerial problem. I think that that's what was called for in his age. I think that the problem right now with our world is that what we have is a spiritual problem. We're not just trying to fix a managerial problem. We're trying to give some people something to believe in and that's going to require a certain amount of changes in form to represent the fact that we actually promise something and that we deliver on our promises generico for 15 dollars usa who are our people it seems the old ways of defining that are more or less obsolete i would feel more able to carry on traditional things if i could define who my people were well you and i both <laughs> Our people are certainly our religious faiths, and they also are, in my opinion, our cultural and ethnic groups. But in our present age of chaos, those cultural and ethnic groups are being mixed up. And so the fault lines are going to change and new ethnicities are going to form. So really for our own purposes, it's in, we have to, in this moment, find our own people and build it out of faith and out of common ethnic practice and out of common political affiliation. These times, these hard times that are now just beginning, these are going to form our concept of who our people are, I believe, in the future. But we have to put work into accomplishing that, and it can only occur in real life. Asteroidal Assassin for USA $3.00. To answer Gray Smog, the evil, the evil Superman trope is popular because the elites fear nothing more than a man which exists outside their frameworks, a Superman issuing them orders. Well, that's another way of putting it. A Superman is also the one thing that could possibly completely invert the existence of our regime as it exists currently. So that is something. Thank you, Asteroidal Assassin. Society Man for $5, plastic sur surgery is viscerally repulsive and makes people appear less human. It strips all the dignity out of old age by turning an old person into a plastic, uncanny imitation of a young person. I grant that, Society Man. In many cases, I've seen plastic surgery do just that, which is why I regard it with an extreme amount of skepticism. There have been cases 
with you know war disfigurations and diseases where it has been useful but but i really think it's a retroactive measure against you know very very extreme cases and it should not be used cosmetically Owen Zelensky for $3 USA. Hello, Dave. I've been loving your recent videos. Thanks for the dinner at the start of the month. I am glad I went. Looking forward to the ball. Uh, looking forward to the ball. Oh, yes. There's an event in D.C. Uh, a ball, I guess. My design for the poster should be going up soon. Well, I've seen one poster for the D.C. event ball. I still need to write my speech for it. But... Um, but the uh, the the, the I, I saw that that was um, yeah I'm I'm looking forward to it too, although God knows how I'm going to write my essays and finish the speech and do all the stuff I have to do, and also do holiday stuff. Gray smog for five dollars USA. Is vegan veganism morally superior to a regular diet? Do we have a moral obligation not to live off the harm of animals? Well, I I believe that there is such a thing as the ethical slaughtering of animals. I think factory farming is highly questionable. I don't know how to separate myself from factory farming in its current state. So I guess there's an ethical case that way. But I think that I don't know how to answer that question. Without going full Peter Singer, I don't know how I'm supposed to actually incorporate my distaste with how factory farms are run with the current insanely high cost of food. You know, there, there's that. Nerve and V-Maker for $5 USA. A response to angry Agorian. Pollyannis' work is good. Uh, Pollyannius's work is good, but he overstates his conclusion. He claims individualism didn't really exist before capitalism. Alan McFarlane shows that individualism was a unique part of English culture from our earliest sources. Yeah, that's my impression too, without having read either of these authors, is that this kind of individualism is, you can see this in Chaucer, right? You can see this in you can see a certain kind of individualism in Chaucer and in earlier sources. It's obviously very much an element uh, of of Northern European culture and European culture more generally. You know, this is it's just it's it's just like that. But anyway, thank you for clarifying on that book that I have not read. Alternative Avenues for ten dollars. Please, please, please do a follow up uh, show to expand more on identifying, countering, and hating the fake, gay, cringe, and retarded. We must affect the new iconoclasm you describe, not calling for Fed posting, but for the manifesting of the strength that is our spiritual and civilizational heritage. Well, I, mean, I think, I think the first step is 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 really to to do what the Basque weavers and the Old Glory Club and the Beowulf Foundation are doing and build institutions and have people gather in real life. If you can have people gather in real life, you can literally make fun of in a collective setting of the things that we're supposed to uh, pay ho pay homage to. We can make fun of the idols physically. We can we can insult them, and we can do so with confidence and, and with poise, uh, looking good. And, and eating well and and praising the Lord. I think this is the first, this is the step that's required right now. Anyway, last one, Generico for $10 USA. Thank you for everything you do, Dave. Happy Thanksgiving to you and all Americans from a non-American country. Well, thank you very much, Generico. I appreciate that. And with that, that is the end of the Super Chats. I will close out now with Psalm 24. A nice short one. I had to resist doing Psalm 23. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, and who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, your gates to be lifted, your ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, your gates, lift them up, your ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. 
Thank you very much for this Thanksgiving Day live stream. Have a wonderful evening and a happy Thanksgiving. I will see you all later. Good night and God bless.